Thank you. Good morning, Sergeant. Good morning. Do we? Do you know, Sergeant, all the jurors here? They're all here. Excellent. Um, we probably need to get Miss Bell and put her on the stand. Well, defense is objecting to some exhibits. So, based okay. on the court's prior ruling, so I anticipate Okay, that and, I, and I do remember I said that I would discuss that. We would discuss that outside the presence of the jury. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you so much. All right, so yeah, let's do that now. And you're going to beg my indulgence and, and allow this one time to break your rule and allow Mr. Escobar to allow those, uh, or argue those objections, Your Honor. Yes. Judge, I'll bring the court the exhibits the defense is objecting to. Certainly. And the state's exhibit, I'm oh, sorry, are we ready to go? Okay. 107A, silencer patents. 107D, photos from a folder on the computer under the username Michael. What was the photos of what? It's just different photographs it's of um, okay. some different cars in the ice cream van, but they came from a folder under the username Michael on the computer. 107E, which are loose photos from inside the username Michael. 107G, photo gun photos from the unallocated space. 107H, gun photos from the unallocated space with their file path. 107I was a query done of the unallocated space and 107L which is a summary of the search terms the state asked Miss Bell to search on the laptop for and I can approach the yes. court. Yes. Can we put them there and I can hand them to the court as I'm arguing? Well, let me, let me just flip through them real quickly okay. just so I have a uh, idea in my head that I'll give them sure. back to you. And the court has previously ruled on all of these exhibits and on motions in limine that allowed the state to introduce photographs from the laptop specifically of firearms. So the state would be objecting to this issue being relitigated. Um, so there were specific motions in limine related to these? There was, Judge. I didn't bring them with me. Okay, this I is the patent them. stuff. You can put it on the podium. This is D, which is photos of a car and ice cream truck. Yes, sir. Inside of the ice cream truck. This is E. You see, E is loose photos. Um, is this that came from a file? So they were outside of a file, but inside the user. Um, Mike. They're on the laptop. So the exact file path, Ms. Bell, is going to be far better at explaining to me. But they came from not a folder titled photographs or something like that, but there was six loose photographs together within the username Michael I've pulled out. I think it's all six of them. All right, and that, that was E. I'm now looking at G, which uh, appears to be different photographs of firearms, both handguns, rifles, semi-automatics, and um, some, uh, just a variety, a wide variety. That was G. Look at H. H is also a variety of guns, again, including semi automatics, revolvers. Handguns and rifles.
I, 107I is similar, except that it also includes some vehicles. And a photos of the stand and various firearms. We, these all appear to be handguns. And then L is a summary, a search summary. First searched, last searched, searched text. Okay. Just that one page or two pages? If you want to put them over there where Mr. Escobar can have access to them. Um, oh, last question is, were they admitted in the prior trial? Yes. All of them? And more. I pared down some of the photographs from the prior trial, and I'm admitting less in this So they trial. came out of what was admitted at the prior trial? Yes. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Escobar. Judge, uh, uh, how long do you think you're uh, going to My colleagues... For just approximately. Of what? D to argue. Oh, I, I don't think long. All right. 15, 20 minutes. Uh, Judge, my colleagues uh, have advised me that uh, it looks like Judge Ward, in making her rulings on the motions, uh, Ms. Khan, can you uh, just uh, yes. highlight what uh, Judge Ward said? This is motions in limine that were argued before which Judge Ward? Samantha Ward. Samantha Ward. Okay. Yes, Chairman. Judge, I'm going to interrupt for a second. It's my understanding that this court heard it either as well or independently of all of that. Judge, that's correct. You had, they filed a motion dealing with the computer and the firearms and the patents on this computer that was heard in front of your honor, and it was denied. You gave them, I didn't bring the written order, so this was handled in front of you as well, Judge. <laughs> judge I, I don't specifically remember it, but I don't doubt it, and I'll send a a text to my uh, staff attorney and just to verify. Well. And, and you think there was an order that I did signed yes, by me? Judge. My J is going to look. We have a folder the, of orders that I did. It was one of the last rounds. Like it's something I think was right before the trial, either the week or two, those last set of rounds of motions that we heard had specifically dealt with the computer, the firearms, and the patents. Okay. Uh, Ms. Khan, can you just read uh, the excerpt from... Sure. Uh, this was the uh, March of, I'll, I'll get the exact date because I'm on page 41 of that transcript and I'll provide uh, do, the exact date. Do you have, I don't need the, necessarily the exact date, but what was the year? Do you have the year? Um, one moment. It was the March 17, two, 2016, Your Honor. This was in front of uh, Judge Samantha Ward, page 41. Um, she said, I'm going to grant it as to paragraph five with the caveat that as to all of these, I mean, evidence may come out of trial that may change the rulings. These are preliminary rulings based on the fact that I haven't heard evidence. So this needs to be, if you believe that it becomes relevant based on evidence, then you can ask for reconsideration of that. Well, wait a minute. If it becomes relevant, so she found something wasn't relevant and actually kept stuff out? Because it sounds like what was being suggested is that she ruled on these motions and they were allowed in. That just doesn't make sense. That they may become relevant and then maybe if she previously ruled that they were not coming in. And Judge, uh, if, if Ms. Khan, can you go through the whole transcript? If I can yeah. start my argument so we sure. don't. Uh, but Judge, uh, you know, of interest, obviously, is the fact that uh, we all recognize under the law that motions in limine uh, should and can be revisited by the court throughout the entire period of the trial. I acknowledge that yesterday and consistent with what Judge Ward had said, what new evidence has come out related to these items? No, just the opposite. What evidence uh, has not come out to make these uh, particular exhibits uh, relevant? So let's talk about, first of all, the uh, silencer. Obviously, when they're introducing evidence, they've got to introduce evidence concerning a material fact at issue. There has never been 
an issue concerning any silencer whatsoever in this particular case. But let me tell you what it does. We do have some people that know uh, on this particular jury that are savvy to guns, that know that you have to have a special permit license to have a silencer. And so why would be, tell me what material fact, I'd like the court to tell me what material fact. I'm not going to tell you anything. Well, but Judge, why, why can't we if discuss If we're going to go down this route where you're going to be asking me questions and to do that, then, then I'm just going to cut it off right now. You want me to tell you what relevant fact. I, want to discuss, I don't have to do that. I want to discuss what material fact. You can this, make your argument. Make your argument. You have my attention on that. Make your argument. Okay. Don't ask me questions. Judge. This does not prove a material fact because there is no material fact whatsoever in this case, not one scintilla of evidence dealing with anybody using a silencer. So the only reason that they would be introducing this is for the prejudicial effect of introducing this. First, it is it's not relevant. Number two, under 403, it is substantially more prejudicial, okay, than probative in this particular case. That's the silencer. And hand, hand that to me. I, I flipped sorry. through it, but I'm go ahead and hand them to me as you make your argument. I will. Thank you. <clears throat> 107 D, and Judge, I didn't name that one. Can you tell the court? Yeah, that is um, 107 A. Okay, so that first argument was 107 A. On 107 D, uh, there's some pictures of a vehicle which are not uh, objectionable, assuming that there is some relevance to the actual vehicle, which we do not know at this point in time. It's it's a vehicle. Well, neither do I, so and, how can I rule? Well, but that's the problem. They're going to have to tell you, hey, why is this particular vehicle relevant? What material fact does this particular vehicle have in this particular case that makes this relevant? If not, it's irrelevant. Well, but let me ask you this, because um, I'm still a little confused as to whether Judge Ward heard that argument and their position as to what it was relevant to when she made her ruling either granting or denying a motion in limine. Judge, neither you nor I were there. I, I, I would love to be able to, to tell the court, hey, this is what she did and this is how she did it. But as you well know, there are not orders in the vast majority of these particular hearings that were had. Uh, I took some of the uh, documents that the prosecution gave me that said they wrote granted or denied on them. And I, I, I believe them when they said, hey, these, this was granted, this was denied. But the fact of the matter is that before this comes in, it's got to be relevant to a material fact and issue. And just having this vehicle without more doesn't allow them to introduce it. May I approach Yeah, you? absolutely. Anthony. Do you know, did uh, Leanne Gowdy ask me to revisit these when they came in? Do you deny, do you disagree with the state's no, if, if they're if they're making their representation, I you know I don't think they're going to be lying to the court. No, uh, but but I mean that they came in. The, just the basic the basic premise that they were admitted. I haven't asked whether um, I want to say Judge Gowdy, but it's Judge Gowdy now. It was Attorney Gowdy at the time. So um, no disrespect to her. I called her Leanne Gowdy. No dis disrespect to her current position, but um, Attorney Gowdy. Whether Attorney Gowdy made any objections during the admission of this evidence at trial, and um, it looks like uh, Ms. Khan has a. Yeah. Your Honor, yes. Uh, if, if I recall reading the transcript, the trial transcript, uh, Ms. Gowdy at the time when they were introduced did make objection, and they were to preserve the record, and they were admitted over Ms. Gowdy's objection at trial. So it wasn't any. It was just it wasn't previously waiver, decided. We're there wasn't just a waiver on Ms. Gowdy's part, right. but as if. Right, she did. Basically, she said based upon the court previous making the objection, admitted over objection. Okay. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you, Judge. Uh, uh, exhibit number ten. Uh, wait, wait. Before you get to that, yes. that one, let me just. D is. Um, D is the two photos in the front that yeah. uh, I have no idea what that's about. All right. Judge, uh, on 107E, there appears to be a, a couple of photos in the front that appear to be the eve of a house. Uh, I don't know what uh, relevance those have. Uh, I believe the last two photos are photos of individuals. I believe that those may be relevant only because they're asserting that those photos were printed uh, off of a printer in the Keatley home and that those photos came from a search of the Hillsborough County uh, database. 
uh, of individuals. And their theory, obviously, is that he was searching for individuals' names. So for the last two, um, you know, I'm not, I, I can't argue against that because I can understand where, where they're coming uh, of a material fact. Uh, the, the first uh, photos of the house, I, I have no idea what relevance that would have. And again, I am not sure that the eve of a house is a material fact at issue in this case. Is it prejudicial, though? What's the prejudicial it, it, effect it all, of the it, eve it, of the house? It, it all depends upon what testimony they have about that. Because we don't know until that testimony comes out. And if the testimony comes out and it's prejudicial, then we've got a problem. We don't want to have a mistrial. I think uh, I think that they I agree with that. I think that they should, you know, tell this court this is the relevancy of this, and then let the court decide. Judge, uh, the next one is it's just outrageous. I, I can't say anything more than this. It's 107 G, and it has a battalion of of uh, guns of guns, and, and none of them, not a single gun, in this particular uh, photo uh, group has any relevance to the alleged weapon that was used in this homicide. And so, let's think about that. Why would the government want to introduce all these different types of guns that were in a computer in the Keatley home that multiple people had access to and that we don't know who actually was searching these particular photos? Well, but don't, you're, you're, you're mixing arguments there. I mean, I thought you were starting to go down what's the relevance of them. It is. But whether they can prove that it was him because there was multiple people, those are two complete. That doesn't affect the relevance. No, no, I, I, I would agree with you. But uh, clearly, what's the relevance of these guns uh, that the government's trying to introduce when none of these guns prove a material fact one way or the other? I know why they're trying to introduce it. It's because they want to you know, try to show an armada of weapons so that this jury at some point in time can say, oh, yeah, look how many weapons this person had. You know, we don't know what, you know, the feelings of these jurors may be concerning firearms. You know, across, a, across the country, there's, there's some really uh, deep-seated feelings concerning whether individuals should arm themselves or whether they should not arm themselves. Doesn't the jury already know that to some degree? I mean, there's been plenty of testimony about multiple firearms being used and fired in his backyard um, by multiple witnesses. Yes, absolutely, but not to this uh, amount. And there's no reason. If they, if they have a particular firearm here that is alleged to have been shot, I'm with it. Hey, let that in because, you know what, that in fact you know, goes to a material fact and issue. But but, those, but those you can't just say, I was shooting with an AK-47, and now you introduce a MAC-10. Which, by oh. the way, a MAC-10 is a machine gun. I understand. But, but that's not exactly the same thing. That's kind of apples to oranges. Those photographs are simply photographs that were searched on the computer, not photographs that he owns. So the analogy to them thinking that he has an armada of weapons is not proven, is not suggested by the fact that he pulled up photographs of weapons on the computer. What material fact does this prove? Okay? What material fact does it have any relevance to? His that knowledge. he that he goes on the internet and he's going on a site and he's looking for guns. What material fact does that prove? Other than to say this guy has a propensity, okay, to like all these sorts of guns. Okay, which this jury could say, you know what, I'm against guns. Why is that guy doing what he's doing on the internet when it does not prove a material fact? Is it his ability to alter firearms an issue in this case? Okay, so let's let's look at photo number one. So his knowledge, general. Tell me knowledge how that photo tells. Tell me how that photo tells us his ability to alter a weapon. Apparently, he's. Searching the computer for firearms. It's yeah, does that tell you that he has the ability to modify or do anything to guns? Look, it is a revolver. It's not even a semi-automatic. It's a revolver. Okay, so someone looks at that revolver and says, Oh, Mr. Keatley must have the ability to, to modify guns because he's got a revolver on his computer. Judge? He's researching guns. Well, that's great. He may be researching guns, but researching guns does not have any relevance to a material fact. Now, I would agree if it had some website or something saying, hey, I'm looking into modifying this gun. And let me tell you, there's even one that I would say, I have to say, this one, 
probably should should come in. Why? Because there's going to be some testimony concerning an individual, uh, uh, Jennifer Clark is going to come in here, that she's going to say, you know, maybe, just maybe, uh, there was a barrel change. I'm not going to argue to you to say that that should not come in. I can understand the relevance of someone having selected this particular picture, assuming that they can prove that he selected this picture in an internet search and it's not the result of some, you know, some picture that as a result of a different query comes up. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue to you, oh, judge, that's not relevant when in fact there's going to be some testimony about a changing of a barrel. This one right here is gun parts. I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue that there is not some relevance with reference to that particular photo. But this gun has nothing to do with this case. Period. And it doesn't prove a material fact one way or the other. But we want to introduce them all. And it's not only here. I'm going to show you the next exhibit where it's duplicates again. And they're just going to pound and pound and pound with weapons which has so much of a prejudicial effect in this case that I think it's the focus of their testimony. That's the focus of their testimony is, hey, Mr. Keatley had you know, a bunch of guns that he may have searched or they may have just popped up. Look at this one. Let me, let me just ask you something while, I'm, while it occurs to me and you're making this argument regarding other weapons. If this was a trial where the defendant was accused of committing a homicide with a lethal um, chemical and the autopsy results uh, revealed a specific chemical, chemical A, but in the search of the defendant's computer, there were multiple searches regarding other lethal chemicals, mm -hmm. not found in the autopsy report, but other lethal chemicals capable of causing the same death by the same means. Your argument would be that those searches by the defendant of other lethal chemicals is not admissible. Judge, it's apples and oranges. The problem here, the problem that it's we... guns have, and drugs, but... No, no, no. I, I, I understand you. I'm, you, you, you I'm being, yes. Okay. It's, it's quite different there because here, okay, this is a pure revolver that even with their ballistics expert says, hey, Rick, you're right. This is in outer space. This has nothing to do with any material fact in this case. Judge, if it, if it has some tendency, any... Of the, uh, I told you a few of them that I'm not going to object to because I can't. As an officer of the court, I can't. But the rest of these, that's the only reason that they're introducing them. And, you know, we've got to protect our system of justice so that that jury doesn't grab on to something that is not relevant and that is prejudicial in an effort to try to convict this man. And I, and I mean that sincerely. This is not just Rick Escobar being an advocate. I mean that. I, I believe in this system if it's done right. But if we do something wrong, uh, it could be horrific. The system could be horrific. This is uh, 107th G. Thank you. Judge, these are, again, all of these. These are uh, the vast majority of them uh, guns that have uh, you know, nothing to do with any of these cases. Now, if any of these guns was a 45 semi-automatic, even if it wasn't a Glock, I wouldn't be here saying, okay, well, you know, if it was a, it was a gun that shot at a 45 ACP, I would say, okay, I can understand why they want to introduce it. But some of these guns, no, the vast majority of these guns, I don't see a single gun that fits the description of anyone, any expert, any law enforcement officer indicating that it's relevant to a material fact here. Uh, again, this is uh, 107H. Thank you. Judge, this is, again, they're, they're very, very tiny um, photos. Uh, I don't know where they're getting these these photos. There's a photo of a Chevy uh, pickup truck, uh, another Chevrolet uh, pickup truck with a tag on it. 
uh, another gun which they can't even tell me what what caliber it is. I just uh, I just asked uh, the prosecutor said, well, what 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 caliber is that gun? I, I don't know, because they're just introducing it for the effect. They're not introducing it in order to try to convince any juror that this has some relevancy to a material fact. They're introducing it so in the hopes that someone here in this particular group is possibly anti-gun and is offended by the fact that someone is having so many guns in their possession. And, and Judge, if, if you think that it could be for any other reason, I'm all ears, literally. Tell me uh, what, and I'll argue. What is I, that one? Let me see. Same thing, except there's some pictures that if they can tie it to searches that were done on the computer, I'm not going to argue about that. <clears throat> And then the last one, which goes to show you their intent, and I'm not saying these prosecutors, I think it's more the, the, the law enforcement, their intent. <clears throat> this, these are search terms. Creeper, I think, yeah, they should be able to get that in, okay? Ocean mist, yeah, I think that search term should be getting in. Silencer, no. There's nothing to do with silencers in this case. But they're looking for a search term of silencer when they're doing the queries on the computer. Omar Balon, no problem. Magazine, no problem. Uniform, no problem. Law enforcement, no problem. Glock, no problem. Drum magazine. Why is a drum magazine important here? You saw that big weapon that they brought here that the court allowed them to, to display here with this big drum and the guy you know, opened the case and got the gun with a big old drum. Let me ask you this. What is was that for? possible though? And Aren't there other cases where, for example, premeditation is an issue here? So searching other types of devices that could be used for a mass homicide, which is the, or well, a mass shooting multiple homicide, which is the facts of this case, um, could be relevant to show um, premeditation, even if those weren't actually used, like a silent search. I mean, it's not a far stretch of the imagination if somebody was planning and premeditating commit the crimes in this, that they considered the use of a silencer and that that, that search would be evidence of premeditation, Judge, even though they didn't use it. Judge, they don't know who was searching. They don't that's know. Another, but, but, no, but, no, but no, that's no. another... That, wait, wait. It's, it's, so, it's a, so it's relevant, but no. they can't prove that no. Mr. No. Um, no. Keeley did I, the I think I think if, if he was doing research in order to determine you know a particular gun that was actually used I'm, I'm with you okay I don't have a problem with that okay but there's a two-step process here for relevancy yes the item you have to determine whether that's relevant to a material fact but you also have to be able to prove the predicate that he was the one that did the search think about it okay it goes back it goes back to my argument that I made weeks and weeks ago if an individual committed a, a, a murder with a green hard hat are you going to introduce the fact that at that person's home there's a white hard hat? I don't think so, he because you're going to say, why in the world is that white hard hat relevant to this particular murder? If that was the case, Judge, you could throw in the kitchen sink in these cases, okay? The kitchen sink, because you're speculating. We are speculating as to what reasons possibly could be out there. That's not the way our evidence code runs. And that's not the way that the defense and the prosecution should be allowed to introduce evidence and not introduce evidence. Uh, the other one's 45 caliber. I don't have a problem with that. Robbery. I, I don't know why they put in you know, robbery. This, this wasn't you know, necessarily a robbery other than the only person that was robbed was, was you know, Mr. Keatley. But robbery is one. I'm not, I'm not wigged out over that. But silencer? Silencer. That's my argument. All right. Um, Ms. Hodges, I know that uh, what you're going to say, <clears throat> and perhaps Judge Ward um, in 2016, and perhaps me in some recent. Um, I can give the court the date of the motion that the court heard. If well, you but, want. but, but, but. Mr. Escobar is right that 403, you know, the relevance, I mean, it's, it's always an issue. Even if ruled on, if it becomes clear to me that that ruling was wrong because it's not relevant, I mean, why let it in 
And, you know, we've gone down this path, and I, I just simply want you, rather than tell me any, it's already been ruled on, just tell me what the relevancy of these are. I mean, it should be simple. You've already done it. You've already convinced two judges, or myself and another judge, of the relevancy. Let me give you the stack back. Um, I think I've looked at them sufficiently enough. But, but for example, let me, let me just ask. I mean, here's the, uh, the silencer. And, and I, I think you can quickly let me know why you think that's relevant. Judge, the defendant is an airline mechanic. He has experience in handling mechanical functions, building, taking apart, repairing things. That's his job. He's got firearms on his computer. He's got silencers. We have evidence to support that the defendant is searching, locating, and saving documents on how to build and assemble silencers. And um, but what material fact um, in in this trial is that <clears throat> those searches or those pictures um, intending on um, proving or disproving? It proves his knowledge, his ability. It's user attribution data on the laptop to show that he is the person who's using this laptop to corroborate the other items that are on there. There's going to be other information included in other state exhibits that's going to show that he has favorites saved on his internet for airline mechanic jobs. There's evidence to support that this is the user of this laptop, this is the person who the state through circumstantial evidence intends to put as the user of this laptop when searches are being made, photos are being downloaded, and websites all are of being that, visited. That, that, that general category of things that you're mentioning go towards any of the elements goes to ID, it goes to knowledge, planning, motive, opportunity, preparation, and premeditation. Okay. Um, <laughs> tell me the um, relevance of the uh, soffit. Miss um, Towers testified that she and the defendant had to drive around together taking photographs and documenting license plates. Detective Lugo is going to testify that, and I can, I'm looking at Ms. Doherty to correct me if I'm misstating what his testimony would be, that he was able to view some of the areas and he can suggest that he believes that is one of the roof lines on Ocean Mist. I'm going to defer to Ms. Doherty if I am misstating that because uh, Detective Lugo is not my witness. That was a photograph that was also introduced in the first trial. So if this evidence gets in through um, Bell because it was on the computer, is it going to be shown to Lugo and Lugo going to comment on these photographs of roof lines? Judge, we can confirm that, but what I can say to the court is I'm not going to be asking Ms. Bell any questions specifically to those photos. So if the court wants to provisionally admit them, but I won't publish those photos, we could address that at a later point if there is some concern about that. Well, there is some concern, and there is concern to just wholesale admit evidence under one witness who's not going to be talked about, and then it's never talked about. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of just dumping in thousands of things and then they're never used in the trial and they just go back there in the jury room. No, what I'm suggesting is that if for some reason Detective Lugo is not able, so what my intention would be is Detective Lugo can't authenticate that those photos came from the laptop. So what I would do is show them to Miss Bell, have her authenticate that yes, those did come from the laptop. My intention would not be to necessarily publish those two roofline photos through Miss Bell because that's not something that she's going to have any relevant knowledge to. There's so actually three or four. There's four. There's going to be additional photos in that packet that would come in through Miss Bell because those are things that she did go back and confirm were on the laptop. What's the, the relevance of the gentleman? That the defendant's searching Hispanic males and he's taking photo. He's saving those photographs onto his computer. So in regards to the roofline photographs, I'm not going to sit here and say that I've got the witness who would be proving that up. So if the court will allow me to show those photographs to Ms. Bell, not publish them, we can then, I'm saying we would, the state would be willing to revisit those photographs at a later point. If they are not something that the state proves up, then I'm going to say that we have no objection to those not going back with the jury because they wouldn't be something of relevance. But I can tell the court that's not a photograph I intend to show Ms. Bell or have her testify to. Is she going to testify to, for example, 107G, is. which is multiple. So she's going to actually testify to each of the, um, well, she is judge, and I can explain to the court the way and how she's going to do that. She's going to have to testify to where those photographs were located, how they got there, and what it means to be in that location. So she's never going to be in a position to say, this is a 22 caliber gun, this is a 45 caliber gun. But what she can say is where those photos were stored, how they got there, potentially the date and time that they were 
put there and the methodologies or the means of those photos ending up in that location. So that does become relevant when we're proving up how those get to unallocated space. What does it mean when they're in, a, in unallocated space? What's the process? What does it mean? I, I think I remember from yesterday that means that they were somehow deleted. <coughs> Essentially. So that's where her testimony is going to go, and that's the very short version, is that they have to be deleted in order to end up in unallocated so space. So it's your position that the fact that he's deleting photographs of um, firearms, all kinds of different firearms, rifles, handguns, semi-automatic, revolvers, um, the fact that they've been deleted is that that's the relevance. Any that's, other? That's partial part of the relevance. What's so the, rest the, of it? the balance of it's going to be the internet searches that are being shown. That there's research, there's search terms, there's things on the computer to support that the defendant is searching for barrel replacements, conversion kits, specific firearms, going to chat forums and websites such as that regarding firearms. So it's not only that those photographs are in the unallocated space but the efforts that have to be taken by a user to put them in the unallocated space, and then the supporting evidence from the reports that are pulled off of this portable case file to show the websites that are searched, the dates, times, all of that corroborates the defendant's knowledge and ability to research firearms, the fact that he is in fact researching modifications of firearms, which is supported by the evidence that we've got through other witnesses in this case. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to comment. I'm not criticizing you on the numbering but because there's always the possibility that the appellate court is going to be reviewing these at some point I'm not sure how I think this came up one time before where I asked and composites weren't it was like 107 and then 107 a they were separate but it, the previous time it came up each was individual right. so my question was why weren't these just done as composites 107 a through whatever but now we've gotten to the point where it's 107 G is the exhibit number, but it's 107G composite, and it's 20-some photographs, so even the exhibit number is not 107 composite 107G 1 through 27 or A through whatever. So I'm just saying that... So I can explain to the court that the reason we use the original exhibit numbers is because it needed to conform with the prior testimony. So that's the reason for that. However, 107G, that was a composite exhibit from the outset. If you flip the pages over, there's handwritten numbers on the back of them. Those are going to not be sequential because I've removed photographs from there as well. Uh, I've you. left all of those in place so that the numbering, if it's referenced by another witness in prior testimony, I was not going to mess it up with that. So what I'll do is I'll refer to as 107G photograph one. Perfect. But it's, I, the I, record will be, it'll reflect which one I'm talking about. It's going to be in non-numerical order. I appreciate that. And that will, and <coughs> whatever, as I said, I wasn't criticizing you, whatever criticism of the way they were numbered previously will be on the previous attorneys and the previous judge, who was me, in the prior trial as to maybe not noticing sure. a, a cleaner way to designate or to name the uh, exhibits. But it is it's absolutely going to be um, essential that if you refer to 107G and then one of the photographs in it, that that be placed on the record and that the record be aware that, uh, that each of the numbers has an individual number on the back. And Each of the photos photo. have an individual number, and you've explained why they're not sequential. All right. Um, same that? argument then, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Uh, let's see. Um, there's 107i, and it's it's again a composite. It Can you show it to me? So yeah. That's what I'm talking about. It's the little thumbnail. So that is a search that Detective Lugo and Miss Bell did together. That's going to be a search of the unallocated space. It's in a different format because it was searched at a different time through a different program. That was done back closer to 2013 before they had Axiom. So that's going to show Hispanic males, the backs of vehicles with license plates shown, and then photographs of firearms. That is all from the unallocated space. And that's what I was going to show this one. That's the back of a vehicle. It's one of the ones specifically referenced by Mr. Escobar in his argument. And it sounds like your position is regarding the testimony of one of the witnesses um, that they drove around the area doing those things. Yes. Same, same argument related to the soffit on the roof. Yes. But going to talk with this witness or ultimately Lugo 
about these? This witness, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this witness that report as well as the supporting files and say, where did these come from? Let's talk about these and show the photographs and say, yes, this photograph of a truck from the back of it, that came out of the unallocated space. This witness is not going to be able to comment, yes, this is a picture that the defendant's driving around taking pictures of license plates, but that testimony has come out through Norman <coughs> Jean Tower. But you anticipate, well, we already had some testimony from former girlfriend, um, what was her Ms. name? Ms. Towers. Ms. Towers, Towers. Yes. regarding him driving around and taking Correct. similar types of photographs. Do you anticipate Lugo is going to also testify to that? I don't know that he would. That's the reason I can okay. say that I would introduce this photo and publish this one now because that testimony has already come in. Ms. Bell's just going to uh, educate the jury on where that photo This is, is Roof, so we already talked about that. Um, Judge, can I just make a comment on Very. She's, she's not... Norma Very Towers easy. says she wrote down. There was no testimony that Norma Towers took pictures. She was he was calling out the numbers. She was writing it down and she was upset. Okay, I don't know where this this picture to the There's no pictures. There were no pictures taken. Norma Towers' testimony no pictures taken. I was writing down as he was telling me what the, the license tags were. What is okay. this? Who's gonna to testify to that? That 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 is a truck that somehow Mr. Keatley took a picture of in order to determine and investigate whether that person was responsible for his okay, robbery. Well, it was a picture on his computer. All right. You, you, all right. What about uh, the pictures of the ice cream truck in 107D? For example, the different types of ice cream. Judge, that's user attribution data that's showing that those photographs came off of the laptop. We can say that this defendant, through other witnesses, drove that ice cream truck. We've got photos of that ice cream truck on his laptop. So we're using that for user attribution data. User attribution. Show that the laptop belongs to the defendant. The defendant's the main user of the laptop. Because I don't have a witness who's going to be able to sit there and say, yes, I saw the defendant typing away on the keyboard making this search, and these are the search Which is one of their arguments, that Correct. other people had access to Correct. it. Which is why user attribution data becomes relevant and important, because when we can show the content of the laptop is corroborated by what other witnesses are saying, and that content is relevant to the defendant's behavior and activities, then we can make the argument circumstantially that this laptop was either in the possession belonged or used by the defendant through the information that's contained in the What laptop. about the cars in the front of that? So the reward poster talks about, and witnesses have talked about that the vehicle that was used to rob and shoot the defendant was a Buick sedan, light colored. We have a vehicle matching that description in the photographs in the defendant's computer. All right. Um, not, uh, not finally, but this one is going to be very similar. 107H is again multiple pictures of uh, so that photograph is, uh, um, weapons. There's weapons. Those are all firearms that are from the unallocated space. The reason that we have H as well is because it shows the file path and the location of those thumbnails from the unallocated space. So Miss Bell is going to be able to testify. Yes, this was in the unallocated space. She's going to be able to explain why some of those photographs are pixelated and why some of those photographs are partially there. The photographs are thumbnails. They're a little bit small and hard to see, which is why G is showing the larger photograph so that the jury can actually see it. But H is giving us the file path so we can have Ms. Bell testify to where the location was of those and how they would have gotten there. Um, as to 107L, which is the search yes, summary, <laughs> the... Uh, even Mr. Escobar acknowledged that several of those searches terms he wasn't objecting to, but specifically the um, silencer. But I've heard your argument now regarding silencer um, and a whole separate exhibit regarding the patent on the silencer. Um, my only question or issue is, is this, is, a, is, this, this is a summary that was created by the witness regarding the witness's work with the computer, correct? Partially correct. So that's it's not something though that anybody is suggesting that was on the computer no. or that Mr. Keatley did. No, and I can explain how that document presents. So when we're looking at the portable case file, the information that Ms. Bell is able to pull from the laptop. There are means of putting that data into a report that looks like the balance of the reports that we argued earlier this week. There's also a very wonky format where it's 
in all of these characters that just becomes too huge to print out. So you can take and copy that data into either a Microsoft Word document or Excel. That's what the court's looking at, is well, that data being I know, copied I, And over. I think I understand it, but my issue, what it's coming back to, is law enforcement or the prosecutor or the government, as uh, Mr. Escobar wants to refer to you, uh, can't create evidence. So this is a creation. It could be used as a, a demonstrative aid, but it shouldn't be introduced as evidence and go back to the jury because it's not something that was physically on his computer or that he created or was even well, in existence until the um, well, analyst went back and, and did that. But that's where I answered your question that you were partially correct. The analyst didn't create that. It's not as though she typed in 11,000 whatever number of searches. When Miss Bell pulls that portable case file and she then filters... This doesn't tell me though how many searches. It just says the word and the, the dates, but it doesn't have it. Oh, it does. oh, it, oh, oh, I apologize. It does. And so when we're looking at that document, Miss Bell's not typing that information in. This is something that is generated through the portable case file. So what Ms. Bell is doing is she is going in and she is typing in those search words. She is then giving the computer and this portable case file the opportunity to search the entire mirrored hard drive to pull the data from all the locations that that word would appear. But it's it still, then, this document is created by some request of the computer. It is created through the it's a program. summary of what's in the computer. But you have to ask sure. the computer, tell me how many times Creeper was used, tell me the first time it was searched, and tell me the last time it was searched, and then the computer prints that out. Yes. So I think it's a created document. It can be used as a demonstrative aid. It can be put up and shown to the jury, but it's not going to come into evidence and go back to them. They're taking notes. And, and you can keep, keep it up there as long as you want and go over the witness to explain all the stuff that you said, but as a, as a item of evidence going back to them, I'm not going to allow it. I, just, I don't think it's appropriate. And the court allowed that exhibit in at the last trial. I understand. I understand. Okay. But two wrongs don't make a right. And just because um, I did something the last time doesn't mean that, that uh, I should... If I made a mistake before I, and I realized that, I shouldn't do it again. So... Um, not saying you can't use it. You can use it all day long. You can put it up on there, but it's a demonstrative aid. It's not going to be admitted into evidence based on the reasons that I said. Understood. Um, and the court's ruling on the balance of the exhibits that we've argued. The balance of the exhibits that you've argued, I am, I'm, I'm going to provisionally admit the photographs of the um, soffit, the roof lines, to see what. Um, Lugo testifies to regarding those. The rest of them, though, I'm going to agree with Judge Ward and with Judge Sabella in the last trial, and I am going to find them to be relevant, and I am going to find that any prejudicial effect of them does not substantially outweigh any probative value of them. Now, that's not to say that the defense is not going to be able to make a lot of arguments regarding weight that the jury should give to them. And the additional argument, I am in no way making a finding that it was the defendant, Michael Keatley, who did those searches, who viewed those items, who deleted those items, which is also one of the, the reasons why I'm making the finding regarding it in unallocated space as being relevant, and I do understand that cross-examination of this witness regarding how stuff gets into unallocated space is going to be an issue, but that goes to the weight that the jury ultimately gives it. But again, I am not suggesting in any way that I'm making a finding that Michael Keatley made these searches, saw these at all before. That is an argument that I suspect the defense is going to make through both cross-examination and final argument to the jury. So that's my ruling um, for the second, third, or fourth time. Mm -hmm. And let the record reflect that the court took the time to consider it and thoroughly review it before making a decision on them. And I'll stop there. Is uh, can we get Miss Bell now? Defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's get Miss Bell. Do you know approximately how long 
I, I suspect you've got a while. I'd say 45 minutes to an hour. All right. We may take, even though we're uh, um, starting late, it's probably best to take our break in between when the uh, state stops and before we do the cross. Yes, sir. All right. They're getting Miss Bell, and uh, I suspect that the jury is still ready. We can go ahead and start and line them up. You can even bring them to the door, hopefully, while those two things will occur simultaneously. The witness will be in the stand, and the jury will be lined up and ready to go, and we'll get started at 9.50. Ms. Bell, good morning and welcome back. Good morning, thank you, sir. We're going to put you on the witness stand before we bring the jury in. I will, uh, I will remind you now and then I will remind the jury that you are still under oath from yesterday. Yes, Jury is present and seated. Everyone else may be seated this time. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. Welcome back. Um, <clears throat> I do apologize. I know we're starting a little bit later than we had expected. I take full responsibility for the delay. We are grateful of your um, presence, your service, and your patience with us at all times, including times of delay. Please do not hold any of that against the attorneys, the parties, or anyone else. Um, I do need to ask you, though, as always, particularly since we uh, broke yesterday and you had the opportunity to go home and have access to uh, outside resources and other people, by show of hands, did anyone discuss this case amongst themselves or with anyone else, or was anyone exposed to anything about this case outside of the courtroom between the time you left yesterday and the time you returned today? Let the record reflect there are no hands. Again, thank you all very much for that. We are going to pick up where we left off. Miss Bell is back on the stand. She is still under oath from yesterday, and I'm going to turn to the state, Miss Hodges, to continue the direct examination. Okay, Miss Bell, we left off yesterday talking about um, the actual items that you received into evidence. Do you want to see the laptop alone or the laptop and the box that showed up to FDLE in? They're both going to be identifiable to me pretty readily, so okay. it's fine. So I'm going to bring you States Exhibit 107 and States Exhibit 203. I want you to take a look at 107 first. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I 
just want to point out to the jury here, I'm looking for this particular case number and my initials and date uh, that I wrote on here back in 2013. And I also recognize uh, the initials of my uh, former colleague, uh, Jerry White, back in uh, 2011, it looks like. What do those initials tell you? Uh, this is the laptop that, I, that was examined originally by Mr. White and then again by myself um, in 2013. So when we're talking about your portable case file, was that the mirrored image of the hard drive from State's Exhibit 107? Uh, the portable case file itself is not the mirrored image, but it was derived from the analysis of that image. Okay, you say it better than I did. Well, All right, showing the State's Exhibit 203. I'll take the one second back. Thank you. Thank you. Do you recognize 203? You can open it. It's already been admitted. Perfect. I do. And you're taking the back off of it to look for your initials and your case file number? That's correct. And this I actually looked at in 2020. So this has my initials and date from 2020, um, and as well as the case number and, and item number. and the portable case file, all of that came from 107? Correct. That's all from the image of the hard drive from that laptop. Now, when you're going through that portable case file from that mirrored image, are you able to see documents that have been saved onto that computer? Well, the portable case is actually something I generated during the analysis of that hard drive's forensic image. So I actually use multiple tools to examine the, the hard drive. Um, in this particular case, the tool that generated the portable case was a program called Axiom, it's, uh, made by Magnet Forensics. <coughs> and uh, that particular program I used to search for internet history and web-related artifacts, as well as operating system information. Um, I used other tools to browse the folder structure um, and look for documents, pictures, etc. So. I believe in 2013 I used NCASE for that purpose. When you're browsing the folder structure, can you go into those folders? Yes, ma'am. Can you look at documents, photographs, whatever may be saved in each of those folders? Yes, ma'am. So when we're talking about this laptop, States Exhibit 107, did it have a user on that laptop? There was a single user and configured user account um, with the username Michael. So when we're talking about a user account, tell me what that means. Um, it's just when you go to log on to Windows, for example, you have your user account that you recognize. So typically, it'll often be a name. Sometimes you'll see it um, as owner or just Windows, whatever it may be. But um, there's one, there's administrative and default accounts that are present on uh, all Windows systems. And then there's user configured accounts that are set up by the, the actual user of the device. Um, and in this particular case, there was only one of those type of accounts, again, that, with the username Michael. So when we're talking about the username Michael, you kind of answered this, but I want to be clear on it. Does that come standard on a laptop when you open it up out of the box? No. Is that something that somebody has to physically create on that laptop? Correct. Can that occur during what I'll call the setup stage of a laptop? Yes, ma'am. Now, when you're in the user Michael. Is that password protected? Uh, it can be, but this particular user account did not appear to have a password. It was noted to be a blank password. Now, when you're looking at what I'll call the back end data on this laptop, did you see any use of that laptop outside of that username Michael? Do you want to ask it a different way? I didn't see any other user accounts or anything. Did you see logins under an admin account or anything that would be someone logging in or using that laptop in a way other than going through the user Michael? Uh, well, anytime the computer is in use, you're going to see what looks like logins in the, in the event logs, but they're really just the system doing what it does. And so any, every time you start a session, these back-end Windows accounts, the administrator, the system account, that kind of thing, they're going to be um, 
quote unquote logging in, but that's not really a user. That's just the system doing what it does. So when you're looking at the laptop, can you see if somebody's saving a document in a folder under the username Michael? I did note documents saved under the user account for Michael. What about photographs? There were photos as well. Okay, so let's talk first about some of the file structures within that username Michael. Did you have folders that contained photographs under that username Michael? Uh, there were. Um, as you may have seen in the, your use of the <coughs> Windows operating system, your user account folder has you know your username and then you'll see like my documents or just documents or pictures, my pictures, um, or your desktop folder, all that good stuff. Those are default folders for, provided for users to save files into. And then um, I did note some files on the desktop, for example. I think there were some files in the my documents folder as well, or at this point it's just this, so it's just called documents. Did you open those folders, those files, and look at those uh, documents or photos that were in there? Yes, it's typical to look at the user directories to see if there are files that may be relevant. Showing defense, States Exhibit 107A, 107D, 107E. Same objections as previously argued, Your Honor. May I approach the You may. All right, without saying what you're looking at, have you seen State's Exhibit 107A? I believe so, yes. Do you recognize it? We do. Look at YouTube. I do. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 107D? There's multiple um, items to that, so just take a look through those. Yes, ma'am. And then 107E. Do you recognize the multiple items in 107E? Yes, ma'am. Have you seen all of these either photos or documents previously? Yes, ma'am. Are they in the same or substantially same condition as the last time you saw them? They are. Do they come from States Exhibit 107, the laptop? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence what's been pre-marked as States Exhibit 107E, 107D, and 107A. Any other objections other than previously discussed at this time? Same objection. All right, it'll be admitted at this time. Okay, Miss Bell, let's start with States Exhibit 107. A permission to publish, Judge? Maybe. There's a screen off to your left. I'm going to put it up there. Before we get into the content of this, what's the location of where States Exhibit 107 came from? Uh, I believe these were documents that were found in the desktop folder for the user account, Michael. So when we're talking about a desktop folder, if a laptop is opened, are these documents on the screen that you would see once the computer's logged in and up and running? Is that the desktop? Right, yes. When you log in and you see the screen and there's little icons on the screen that you can double click, that's your desktop. These documents were saved in a folder on that desktop or individually on that desktop? Uh, I don't recall from the top of my head. I'd have to actually look at the, the file path. To Fair confirm. to say that you know they came from the desktop? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How many documents, and I can bring them to you if you want, were there 11 documents that were all similar that were saved together on the desktop? Uh, that does sound correct. In 107A. And is this the first page of each of those documents that says U.S. Patent? Yes. <coughs> when you're going through these documents, are you reading and looking at the content of the documents as well? Uh, not particularly thoroughly in this particular instance. The, these were identified as, number one, they're p potentially of value because they're user-generated documents that don't you know, they're not on every Windows system. So I'm going to provide that information back to the reviewing agency. Um, and then, in addition, I also performed keyword searches. Uh, and one of the keywords, actually, I think that was an initial keyword search that was done by Mr. White for the term silencer, and it pulled up um, So let me, let me stop you for, right, for a second right there. Yes, ma'am. As part of your analysis and your work, did law enforcement ask you to search specific words on this laptop? 
Correct, yes, okay. they requested particular search terms. Was one of those words silencer? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, we're going to get to all of that in a little bit, but did that, in your work, make these documents more of interest to you, States Exhibit 107A? Uh, they're, we're automatically, I was going to be providing those anyway, so, I mean, they're, because they're user-generated documents in a user folder, those are typically going to be provided for review for, so the investigator can um, examine those to see if they're relevant to their case or not. Now, when you're doing your work, have you been made aware either through a short synopsis that's given to you or actual conversations with the lead detective in this case, what the detectives may be interested in for your work? Yes, ma'am. So you've got some background information at the point that you're doing your analysis. Yes, ma'am. There's typically an offense date provided, and in this case there were keyword search requests. So then we'll go through the balance of States Exhibit 107A. Is all of 107A U.S. patents for silencers? I believe they were patent documents, yes. All right. And was there 11 of them total? Yes, ma'am. In your review of this laptop, States Exhibit 107, were there photographs located on that laptop? There were. All right, I'm going to show you in permission to publish 107D. I'm going to show you the photographs from 107D. Was this a photograph that you located under the username Michael on the laptop? Identify it specifically yes, by sir. the number on the back. I apologize. Three. 107D3. Yes, ma'am. Tell me the file structure or the folders that contained the photographs from 107D. I believe these were located in the pictures directory under the Michael user account, and then some may have been located in the, there was a, another sample pictures folder within the pictures directory. We're going to get to those. Were they? Did you consider those to be almost loose photos because they weren't in the picture file structure? Uh, they were just in a different folder. Okay. They were still under the Michael user account though. 107D4. Another photograph from the pictures folder? Yes, ma'am. Oops. 107D5? Yes, ma'am. 107D22? Yes, ma'am. All still located in that same file structure? Correct. All right. 107D23? Yes, ma'am. 107D24? Yes, ma'am. 107D25. Yes. And then I'm going to show you 26, 107D26. And then 107D27. Yes. Now to ask probably a very simple and obvious question. When you're looking at photographs that are in a folder structure under a username, do those photos have to physically be saved to that location and that device? Uh, correct. Now it sounds kind of obvious, but when we're looking at States Exhibit 107D, does a person have to go in and save that specific photo to that specific location? Yes, it wouldn't just automatically exist on the hard drive or anything in that in that location. Are there other things that can automatically exist on the hard drive? Uh, well, I mean, just by virtue of running, there's going to be a lot of information that's just saved by the operating system, and that's in a system-protected area that the users can't really access. So uh, that is going to happen. There's going to be a lot of information that is not knowingly generated by the user or saved by the user on a computer. Are there some computers and um, phones or devices that can come with either some standard 
photos, standard music, things that are part of the operating system that would automatically be there despite the user not putting them there. Yes, and that is like in the sample pictures you might see something in there that um, might be you know wallpapers you could use that kind of thing that comes pre-installed on Windows. That's separate than what we're talking about here with specific photos in 107D that have to be saved to a location. Right, these would not pre-exist on the Windows operating system prior to user activity. All right, 107E. One oh seven E five. Where did this photograph come from? I don't recall the exact file path just from looking at it. Actually, just I, because I don't have the actual fold like pictures any, and we don't retain them in the case file. I just have the the listings. If your notes and I just said loose the, photos, would that have come from under the username Michael? Loose photos. Can you maybe restate? I'm not sure I understand what loose photos All right. mean. When you're looking at the file path structure on the hard drive itself, we're talking about not unallocated space, but the balance of the hard drive. If your file path showed that this was under the username Michael and was, con it was labeled loose photos, would this have been something on the hard drive itself, but not in the unallocated space? Uh, if it had a file path with the, I would expect to see, you know, C, users, Michael, and then either pictures directory or the sam pictures, sample pictures or something to that effect. Um, I don't know that I recall seeing, or it may just be like under the user account directly, just like C, users, Michael, and then the file names themselves appear listed. When we're talking about unallocated space, and we're going to get to that in detail in a little bit, but short answer for right now, is that a different, for layman's terms, area of the hard drive that is not associated with something that can actually be seen on the desktop or in a file structure. So the unallocated space is just anything that's not currently in use by a file um, or, or a folder actively avail accessible to the user. So there may be previously deleted files that still reside in the unallocated space, um, but you as a user would not be able to access them anymore. Okay. Now 107E6. Was this photograph located on the computer under the username Michael? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I want to talk about unallocated space. We kind of went through that at a little bit higher of a view. I want to talk in depth about what does the term unallocated space mean. So for files and folders that are currently in use or accessible active files and folders, those are part of the allocated space, meaning the operating system is tracking where that information is saved on the hard drive and keeping track of it because those files still need to remain accessible to the user, right? When a file is deleted, or for areas of the drive that haven't been used or sa you know, used to save a file to yet, that area is called the unallocated space. And that's the area of the drive that you can save new data to. But if there's information that, say, a file was deleted, it doesn't actually get purged from the drive immediately. The operating system just flags that space that was previously associated with that file is now unallocated and available for a future file to be saved. Prior to a new file being saved there, though, that data just still remains in place on the drive and is potentially recoverable via, via forensic software tools and techniques uh, like we use in the lab. If a user goes in and hits delete on a document or a photograph, does it go to the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah. it may, let me just briefly, it may go to the recycle bin first, it, which is not a true deletion, it's really just a move. Um, because why? You want to, Windows wants to make sure if you change your mind, you get the opportunity to get that back, right? Um, but once you empty that recycle bin, then it is truly deleted and in the unallocated space. So we go from, let's call it a folder on the desktop, to the recycle bin, to the unallocated space. Yes, or you could just skip the recycle bin altogether if you, you can configure your system to do that, or you can just hold shift and hit delete, and 
it'll skip the recycle bin. Bottom line, if something is physically deleted, it you know, whether it goes through a cycle bin or not, it's going to go to unallocated space. That's correct. Now, when we're talking about unallocated space, does that mean that that photo or that document still exists on the hard drive, even though it's been deleted and now assigned to the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to use layman terms. I know you're going to clean them up. If we've got a certain amount of space available and unallocated. If that space gets filled up, the unallocated space is filled up, is there a means within the hard drive that new stuff can be deleted and put into the unallocated space? And what happens to the stuff that had previously been there that was older in the unallocated space? Well, wouldn't necessarily be concerned about the unallocated space filling up because the operating system doesn't care about the tracking the unallocated space or writing over it or anything like that. It's not trying to keep it to a certain size or anything like that. Um, so, you know, there are, like I said, if it's if until new data is saved to a particular location in the unallocated space, whatever was there before is still going to sit there. Um, so that process of when new data gets saved to that location is called overwriting. And so you may find part of a file in unallocated space and the rest may have been overwritten. Um, or it could be that it got overwritten during a process called disk defragmentation that you can run in Windows to you know, supposedly improve the performance of your hard drive. That was true when we were using mechanical hard drives that had little read write heads that went back and forth to read the data. Um, it was actually a process that made those uh, pro the read-write heads operate more efficiently um, because the data associated with current files was moved closer together, um, and that could potentially overwrite information it, that was in the unallocated space before just by virtue of it moving the current data around. You alluded to it a little bit, and I want to talk in detail about it, that there may not be full files. So if you have a photograph that has been deleted and put into the unallocated space. Do you have the potential for that entire photograph to no longer exist? Absolutely. So explain what we mean by that. Uh, well, photos can be fairly large files and they take up more than one chunk, if you will, of um, the, the space on a hard drive that the operating system tracks. So you may have, say, a photo that takes up 10, it's called sectors, of, of a hard drive. That's how they're divided. That's the smallest unit that a, a hard drive can write to. Um, and it, maybe it takes up 10 sectors. But a new file gets saved to five out of the last 10, right? You might recover the first five sectors of that photo, and then the last five sectors have been lost and overwritten with new data. So you end up with a rather fragmented looking folder, or excuse me, picture. It would be like half an image or something like that. Is that something that you? Maybe not typically, but you have seen when you're looking at photos in the unallocated space. Oh, it's definitely not uncommon. What about pixelation of photos in the unallocated space? How does that happen? Uh, well, pixelation refers to the resolution of the photo itself. So I mentioned earlier, like, photos can be pretty large files. Typically, the larger the file size, the higher the resolution of the picture, which means a higher resolution photo is probably more likely to take up more space and consequently be more vulnerable to getting overwritten with new data, right? If you have a really small photo, it takes up very little space, and it might actually escape overwriting for a while. You know, it, it might sit there, but it's such a tiny photo that when you actually try to open it up and look at it and enlarge it, it looks real grainy. That's what that pixelation term means, and it's not really high resolution. Uh, so you might see a photo that you're able to recover, um, but you know it's it's not like the clearest photo you're ever going to see. Now, when we're still talking about the unallocated space, can things end up? And I'm going to again use layman terms, so I know you're going to clean them up. Can things end up in the unallocated space that weren't deleted? I mean, I suppose if you did like a format or some sort of reset or a restore operation um, that you could theoretically, something will be moved to the unallocated, but you didn't formally delete it or make it a process of actually clicking delete on that file. For 
everything other than what you just described, you have to click delete to have something go to the unallocated. That is the typical way that things end up in unallocated. Okay, let's talk about 107G, showing defense. May I approach the witness? You may. Showing you what's been pre-marked as State's Exhibit 107G. Have you seen this uh, set of documents before? I have. Do you recognize it? Yes, ma'am. Is it in the same or substantially same condition as the last time you saw it? Yeah, it is the same. Right, Your Honor, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence with the pre-marked as State's Exhibit 107G as Any, 107G. Anything other than previously discussed? Same objection, Your Honor. All right. It'll be admitted at this time. Thank you. Permission to publish. You may. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to show you 107H as well. We'll handle both those together. I should have brought you both along. Showing you 107H, do you recognize that? I do. Do you recognize the information contained within that document as well? I do. Your Honor, this time I'd ask to move in the evidence what's been pre-marked as 107H as 107H. Any other objections? No, Your Honor, same objections. All right, be admitted. And permission to publish. You may publish. Okay, let's start with 107H and we're going to go back to 107G. Okay. Showing you the first page, and they're documented up here at the top, page 1 of 25. Before we get into the content of 107H, what are we looking at here for the location of this information? So this is a report that I generated, and it was titled Unallocated Pictures, but you can see um, there's file paths here. This first one lists um, recovered folders, which I can explain further, but most of them are going to say unallocated clusters, um, which is what we previously discussed. Recovered folders is another, um, it's a term that's used by the forensic software when it finds deleted files for which it doesn't know the parent directory anymore, but it still knows the file name. They've been deleted um, from, the, like the parent directory itself was deleted, but it doesn't know exactly, uh, it's reconstructing the folder structure based on what it was able to see that remnants of the file information in the operating system, um, but that information is no longer an active file. All right, so when we're looking at States Exhibit 107H, when this hard drive is mirrored and you have your working copy, what is the location of the photographs contained within 107H? These are files recovered from the unallocated space. Files that had to be deleted in order to end up in the unallocated space? Objection, Your Honor, leading. Sustained, rephrase. When you're looking at the file path and the file structure on 107H, do you have information to suggest how they get to the unallocated space? I'm less concerned with the how they got there from my end just as that they were there. Like my ability to view these pictures came from searching the unallocated for pictures. Um, that also is typically where deleted files reside, but you know, I'm not necessarily able to say how they got there definitively. And page two of 107H. When we're looking at these photographs, same location? Yes. All the photographs in 107H, where's the location that you recovered every single one of the photographs in 107H? <coughs> H. These are all recovered via searches for, from, for the unallocated space. Now, when we're looking at 107H, is this everything that's in the unallocated space? No, ma'am. Is there far more data that would be included in the unallocated space than what we've put into 107H? These were specifically identified, I believe the investigator uh, came and sat with me for a bit as I review, like, and reviewed these and he flagged them because I'm not really privy to the, you know, the investigative details. So I scheduled an appointment with him. He came in and sat there and told me what to include in this report for this particular report it was the only one that was like that. But. All right, I'm gonna move it down to the bottom of page two and then we'll move on to the other pages of 107H. Page 3 of 107H. This is going to be the top half of page 4 and the bottom half of page 4 of 107H. Page 5, 107H. Page 
page six, top half, bottom half of page six. Page 7 of 107H. Page 8 of 107H. Now let's stop here for a second and let's talk about the photographs. Are these photographs as you find them in the unallocated space? Yes. Has there been anything done to these photographs to either enhance them, change their location, anything by you? No, ma'am. When you're documenting these photographs under States Exhibit 107H, is this exactly how you find them within the unallocated space on that hard drive? Yes. One oh seven nine uh one oh seven H page nine. Top and then bottom. One oh seven H page ten. Let's talk about this top photograph here. Why does it look the way it does? Uh that particular file appears to have been one of those where it was partially overwritten. So when we're looking at that photograph and we see kind of the blocks of color down along the bottom. What does that indicate to you? That it was likely partially overwritten. Does that, in my layman terms, mean we're losing part of that file? Yes. Okay. Now let's go down to the bottom of page 10. I want to ask you the same questions about the bottom photograph on page 10 of 107H. Is there something on that photograph that would indicate to you it's just a partial file? The same phenomenon as before. Is that uncommon to see? No. 107H, page 11. One oh seven H page twelve, page thirteen, page top of page fourteen of one oh seven H and bottom of one oh seven H, page fourteen, page fifteen. Page 16 of 107H, top and bottom. Page 17 of 107H. Now this one, same kind of questions for you. Was that partially overwritten in the unallocated space, the bottom photograph that's red? It does appear to be. Page 18, top and bottom 107H <clears throat> page 19 of 107H page 20 page 21 Page 22, page 23, top and bottom, page 24, top, bottom, and then page 25 of 107H. Now, Ms. Bell, you had mentioned earlier about some photos being pixelated based either on the size or potentially not complete because of its location in the unallocated space. Fair to say? Yes. Okay. When some of these photographs from 107H are enlarged, do you, does that pixelation or that partial file become more obvious? Definitely. All right, let's talk about 107G. Where did 
the photographs and permission to publish. I don't know if I asked. 107G. Was that admitted? It was. All right, you may publish. Okay. Um, where were the photographs in 107G located when you mirrored the hard drive? These were recovered from the unallocated space. All right, and we're going to go through these 107G1 unallocated space. Yes, ma'am. Now, when we see a full non pixelated file in the unallocated space, does that give you any information about the date or time that it would have been placed there? No, there's no information available from the file system anymore about that file. Sometimes with pictures, you can find information internally um, that's captured inside the file itself, and that's going to be more reflective of when the image was captured, if it was taken with a digital camera or a smartphone or tablet, something like that. You may remember seeing these if you've ever gotten photos from a, a digital camera developed and maybe it prints the date on the front. Um, and you've set your date and time correctly in your digital camera, or maybe you're getting photos printed that say they were taken in January 1st, 2004. But the point is, that's all internally maintained within that, uh, that actual picture file. That's called EXIF data. Um, but as far as the file system itself, pictures and videos and any files recovered from unallocated, there's no longer information about when that file was saved to the hard drive, what folder it was saved to, um, that information is no longer available for those files. Now when you're talking about file, the data within the picture itself, that's going to be completely separate than what may be stored by the computer once it gets to unallocated space. Correct. Okay. 107G, number two. Also from the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. 107G3. Yes, ma'am. 107G4. Yes, ma'am. 107G5. Yes, ma'am. 107G6. Yes, ma'am. 107G7. I want to talk about this one for a second. Do you see these white blocks on this photograph? Yes. Did you put those there? No, ma'am. When you're looking at this photograph, to include those white blocks that are on those pho on this photograph, both here and up here, is that exactly how you found the photograph? Yes. And where was this photograph located when you found it on the hard drive? It was in the unallocated space. 107G8. Now when we're looking at this photograph, we've got a URL or a website down here at the bottom. How's that information captured? I mean, I don't know how it got there. It was just in the picture as I recovered it, so. Not anything you put there? No, ma'am. Not anything that you would have researched and added to this photograph? Definitely not. Where was this photograph located? I believe it was also from the unallocated space. 107G9. Yes, ma'am. 107G10. Yes, ma'am. 11. 107G11. Yes. 107G12. Yes. 107G13. Yes. 107G14? Yes. And 107G15? Yes. All of 107G is from the deleted space on the computer? They were all recovered from the unallocated space, yes ma'am. Show and defense was completely marked with state's exhibit 107i. <coughs> Showing you 107i, do you recognize it? I do. Do you recognize the information that's contained in there? I do. Is it in the same or substantially the same condition as the last time you saw it? It is. Right? 
Your Honor, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence what's been pre-marked to State's Exhibit 107-I as 107-I. Second objection. It'll be admitted at this time. Permission to publish. You may publish. Ms. Bell, I'm going to show you the first page of State's Exhibit 107-I. It is tiny, so I'm going to zoom in and then we'll back out from there. That's fair. Okay, let's start up here in the top left-hand corner. What is this document we're looking at? So this is another report uh, generated from a different program, not the NCASE software. This is from a program called NetClean Analyze DI. When was this report generated? Uh, this report, does that date in the top left-hand corner suggest to you when this report was generated? It could be the printed date, actually. Okay. Did you and Detective Lugo sit down and discuss the contents of the laptop prior to this report being generated? We did. Um, as previously mentioned, he came and met with me. So the date that's reflected on the top left-hand corner may not, in fact, be the date you generated the report? I, I don't believe it was. Can that be the date that this actual piece of paper was printed? Yes, that could be. Okay, so now let's talk about the contents of this. When we're looking at that kind of Excel spreadsheet, I'll call it, with the image ID number, thumbnail, visual copies, you see where I'm referencing up here along the top? Yes, ma'am. Where's all of that information coming from? That is information the NetClean software is uh, providing to facilitate review and um, provide information about the recovered files. So now let's talk about what's this information that's included within the blocks inside of that spreadsheet. What are we looking at? So this particular program is actually used to review f pictures and video files uh, because it has some really cool features actually that let you like deduplicate. Um, copies so that you don't have to look at the same picture 16 times if it is the same you only see it once um, but so that makes it much more efficient for reviewing pictures and videos which is why I was using it um, but it also allows you to identify you know which files have that embedded EXIF data that I mentioned earlier and you can see that in that column there EXIF you can also let me, see, hold on, let me stop you for a second so when I'm you're sorry. saying no EXIF data is this the column that you're referring to Yes, ma'am. So if there was EXIF data, is that going to give you potentially information on either when that photograph was taken or when that photograph was downloaded? It, it could. Okay. Without any EXIF data, do you have any idea when that photograph was taken, viewed, downloaded, any of that? No, ma'am. Okay. Where is the location for all of the items included in States Exhibit 107I? So. This, These the photographs that are here, the information that's here, where did that exist on the laptop? These were all recovered from the unallocated space as well. And do you have a way of seeing on this document that in fact the file name is in the unallocated space? Well, the file name itself is just assigned by the process used to recover the pictures and videos. So there isn't an actual file name. It just tells you where in the unallocated space it was recovered. Um, again because it is in the unallocated space, we don't know what that file was called when it was an active file. Um, we don't know what folder it was in, and we don't know any dates and times about when it was saved or um, if it was ever modified or anything like that. So when we're looking at this document, does the fact that it says unallocated clusters indicate anything to you about the current location of that photograph when you mirrored the hard drive? So that particular field is telling me that it, not only that it's in the unallocated space of the hard drive, but also um, which offset, like at what location within the unallocated space was it found. Okay, so let's look at the bottom half of the first page of 107i. Same information, but for different photographs? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Were these photographs then, um, I guess, blown up, for lack of a better term, to make them larger than the tiny little thumbnails here? Uh, they're provided as their actual size, so I don't do any enlargement or enhancement or anything like that with these pictures. They're just, along with that report, the pictures themselves are provided, just the files. And 107i, the second page, let me back this up just a little bit, second page of that document, is that one of the photographs that correlates to the first page of 107i? Yes, ma'am, I believe it's the first one. First photo, okay. Do these photographs that we're going to go through go in order down that kind of 
cover sheet front page. Yes, I believe they should. All right. One of seven I page three. One of seven I page four. One of seven I page five. One of seven I page six. Do we have another example of the full file not being there because it's in the unallocated space? Right, so this is just a partial image that was recovered. So this will be page 7 of 107i, located in the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. 107i, page 8, and page <coughs> 9. All right, now I want to go from where you're looking at photos and documents that you can find on the computer to what I'm going to call the backside data that a user who's sitting in front of the computer can't necessarily see. Do you understand where I'm, what I'm referencing? I believe so. Okay. Um, when you're doing your work, were you asked to do keyword searches and generate uh, what the computer calls reports? but essentially information from this portable case file of the mirrored hard drive. So when I run the keyword searches, I'm searching for the terms provided across the entire hard drive, anytime they appear. Um, so it's going to be, whether it's unallocated or some system file or a, a file you saved on your desktop, whatever it may be, it's going to turn up in that keyword search. Okay. I'm showing Defense 107L and 107B. Approach the witness. All right, Ms. Bell, I'm showing you what's been pre-marked as State's Exhibit 107B. Do you recognize that? I do. Is it in the same or substantially the same condition as the last time you saw it? Yes. Okay. And I'm showing you what will be a demonstrative aid that's labeled as 107L. Okay, yes. Can right. you recognize that? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence 107B and then use as a demonstrative aid 107L. Any objection to the admission of B or the use of the demonstrative aid? No, Your Honor. Okay. It'll Permission be admitted and you may both. use. Permission to publish both. You may publish. I'm going to start with 107L. All right, what are we looking at here? So this is a report that I generated um, in the course of doing the keyword searches on the hard drive from the laptop. Um, it lists what search terms I used over on the far right column, the times, dates and times that I ran the searches, um, and then on the far left column you see the total number of hits on the hard drive for each term. Um, I should note in the search text you may see some what appear to be curious symbols um, or things that maybe you wouldn't expect to see as part of a keyword, but they actually are really just um, wildcard parameters, if you will, that let me search multiple possibilities. So I'll just point to those bottom two there. Are you um, talking about the, I'm going to interrupt you for a second, 45 caliber? Yes. Down here with the question mark in it? Yes. What does that question mark allow you to do? So that just lets me search for 45 with a space in between caliber 
or not. That's what it is. So it's like either way, the, the program will find that keyword if it appears with a space in between 45 and caliber or if there's no space. So let's go one line up and look at where it's I line YBA line ERRA. What does that mean? Uh, so that operator, the little vertical pipe that is letting me search for either I or Y and then B and then either A or E and then RRA. So any combination of those uh, particular letters in con uh, all together is uh, going to give me a positive keyword hit. All right, so I'm going to just let you account for different possible spellings. Uh, see if in one search. making you see sick. All right, so let's go with this top line where we see search text and then you have creeper underneath here. So let's use that as kind of our starting point to talk about this. Was the word creeper something that was asked of you to search? Yes, ma'am. Now the last search and the first search, the two columns of dates we have up there. Before we get into the data that's in there, what did the term first and last search mean? That's just when I executed the keyword search. So when we're looking at the date of March 21st, 2013, is that the date that you went into this program, typed in Creeper to see how many times you would get a hit? Yes. First and last search dates and times are exactly the same. Why? I only ran the search once. So when you search the word Creeper, how many times did you get a hit? There were uh, 185 hits on that particular term. Now you talked about this briefly, but I want to go back to it a little bit more. Where did you search for the word creeper? That's going to be anywhere it appears on the hard drive. Unallocated space? Including unallocated space. Recycle bin? All of that. Anything that may be in an active file path? Yes, ma'am. What the user can see on the desktop and documents internet searches, Correct. things like that? Yeah, the only thing that you might not get a hit on if it was there is say for example, it was like a picture of a sign or something that said creeper, you know what I mean? It would, if it was a picture of the letters rather than actual text content. Um, but any text content on, on that hard drive is gonna be searched. How many times did you get a hit for the search term creeper? 185. What about ocean mist? You searched that term? Yes ma'am. How many times did you get a hit on the laptop for Ocean Mist? At 92. What about Silencer? 497. Bayon? That looks like 11. Omar? 11,602. Magazine? 1,984. Uniform? 3,996. Law Enforcement? 22. Glock? 2,353. And then you've got, for law enforcement and drum magazine, it's two words in that search. Are you searching the phrase drum magazine or does drum and magazine get searched separately? For those two, it's the whole phrase. So when we're looking at the phrase law enforcement, it's that entire phrase that you find 22 times on the computer? Yes, ma'am. And for drum magazine, how many times is that phrase located on the computer? 123. And again, that's for drum space magazine. It has to be appearing exactly that way. So if it was drum and magazine without a space in between it, but running together, is it going to show up in your search? No. What if there was a period in between drum and magazine? Only if there was a space would it hit. Right. Robbery. How many times do you see that search? 69. Okay. How many times do you see that word, I should say? 69, sorry. And then I'll let you go through how you're going to spell the bottom, the second to last one for your hits. So that's if the term either I B A E R R A or I B E R R A or Y B A R R A or Y B E R R A. Any of those combinations. Um, and that appeared 251 times. What about 45 caliber? Four. Now you talked in terms of um, demonstrative aid 107L, you talked about kind of characters or things that would be abnormal. When we're looking at the actual hits themselves, where these search terms are located on the computer, do you often find strange characters other things besides the 
alphanumeric lettering and numbering along with these hits? Yes, very often. How come? Well, sometimes they're parts of other words or they run on to other words that might be used really commonly in like programming or something like that. Um, so you'll see hits in a lot of system files and things like that that are actually just uh, garbage. So uh, for example, you know, I can think of a good example is like if I was to search for uh, uniform is a good one actually where you're probably going to get a lot of hits because URL or web address stands for uniform resource locator and sometimes you'll see that word in various system files or web pages, what have you. And it's not anything that's actually going to be you know, referencing um, a uniform like you and I would think of clothing uniform or anything like that. It's just, so there's a lot of, of instances where the hits are maybe numerous, but not really, really relevant to the examination or the investigation. Is 107B not an exhaustive, but essentially a summary or partial list of some of these exact hits that you were getting for each of those words? Yes, these are the ones where I was like, okay, I will, these are readable. Um, and they may have some value and I'm going to provide those for the investigator to review. If some of these words in your key search show up in the unallocated space, can you see that the word exists? For sure the word is present. Can you put that word into context all the time if it's in unallocated space? No, unfortunately not all the time. So you may see the word, but not know the context that goes with it. That's correct. So when we're looking at 107B, are these some, not all of the keyword search hits you get that you could put into context? Right. This is, I call, it's called a text fragments report, um, where it just actually is showing the snippets of text found around the actual keyword hit. All right. So 107B, this is page one, and I will zoom out. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that we can actually read some of this. So at the top of this document, does it tell you what keyword search this document relates to? Yes, ma'am. So for page one of 107B, what was the keyword search that you were looking at? This was for the ocean mist keyword search term. Now let's go down to what would be the second portion right here where we see the parentheses around ocean mist homicide rec period, close parentheses. What information is that giving you regarding that search term? That's just the text that was around the keyword hit. Um, it appears to have a URL near it, so maybe it's some sort of web-related activity. There, you do see below that it has IE history, and then a very long series of... Um, Are you talking about right here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, you know, where it shows a long series of S1-5-21, et cetera. Um, that is actually called a security identifier, but it's associated with the user account uh, that's configured on this computer. Now, let's look at what is labeled as number two. We see down here where it's got ocean plus mist plus Ruskin. What does that plus sign and what's that kind of contextual information around it tell you? So there's actually several things in this particular URL. You can see um, that it says Yahoo search results at the end. That's like the title of the web page, basically. Um, and you can see P equals. And on Yahoo, when you do a search on Yahoo, or at least in 2010, it was like this. The search term would be captured as part of the P equals. It would then list the search term. And the plus just indicates that multiple words were searched simultaneously. So P equals Ocean, Mist, Ruskin. Those all the Ocean plus Mist plus Ruskin means all three of those words were searched on Yahoo. And then later, at, toward the end there, you see this um, series of numbers, 12889205475. And just a fun fact, that is a Unix timestamp. So. Um, computers do this weird thing where they keep track of dates and times differently than we do and they like to count frequently anyway. Um, the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970 at midnight. So that is actually a timestamp um, which captures when this Yahoo search occurred. So when this Yahoo search was conducted, was Ocean searched alone, Mist searched alone, and Ruskin searched alone or were all three of those words in the same I'm going to call it search bar on Yahoo. They were part of the same search query. So
So when we're looking at ocean mist Ruskin with the pluses in between, does that indicate to you that the order of those words in the search bar was ocean mist Ruskin? Yes. All right, so then we're going to go to the next search term, <coughs> Ivara. What are we seeing here? Under that number one, and then we'll go to number two. So tell me what the information under this number one right here with the Yahoo search results means. That one just looks like it's just maybe a web page title. Um, as previously noted, if you uh, it's the web page title is what like appears at the top of the browser tab. Um, when you do a Yahoo search, it'll have whatever you searched and then Yahoo search results. Now, we're seeing up in the top right hand side, it says unallocated clusters. What does that tell you regarding this text fragment of Ibarra? So that just means it was found in the unallocated space. Without any additional information with that date and time stamp that's embedded in the URL, do you know when that search would have been conducted? Uh, I do not, not from that first hit. The second one might. You want me to put the second one back up for you? That information right there? Um, you can see in the URL there, again, it's the same thing with the P equals and then Well, you can if see you the want two your terms. terms. There's a um, yardstick in front of you. If you want to stand up and point to it where you're referring to. Oh, I'd like to. So you can see there just the P equals again, which, again, that's just consistent with multiple searches, uh, most, multiple words being searched simultaneously, so as one search query. So we have, I guess, Angela plus Ibarra. And then uh, down here, is where you can see potentially a possible timestamp um, that one two eight eight zero five five eight four zero. All right, you may want to just stay standing for the next one too. Oh, okay. <coughs> of one hundred seven B search term Bayan. So let's start at the bottom and work our way up. Under number three, what does that information there tell you? Uh, just that this particular. Uh, search term was found next to these two other words um, and what is called the hyperfile.sys. So this is a laptop and you may, if you've ever used a laptop, recall that when you close the lid or you can tell it to hibernate or sleep, it captures, it saves like a little snapshot of what the system current state is so that when you open that laptop back up, you, you're back in action right where you left off, right? So it's saving that snapshots in this uh, hyperfile.sys file. Um, that's a system file. It's not something you can just go in and access and change you know, as a user, typically. Um, it's maintained by the operating system and written to um, when those sleep sessions or hibernation, hibernation sessions occur. So when we see Bayan, uh, sorry, Bayan, Ruskin, Florida next to each other in a hyperfile, what does that tell you? Uh, that just means that the words were next to each other when they were saved there. Would the laptop either would have been shut or put into sleep mode? Right. Does it tell you, is that in internet history? Is that on a Word document? Does it give you any of that information? No, I can't tell that from here. Just that we've got those three words next to each other? Yes, ma'am. All right, so when we're looking at item number two on this page, Bayan, Ocean, Mist, and CT, do we also have that in a hybrid file? Yes, ma'am. Can you date and timestamp either the hybrid file for number two or the hybrid file from number three? Um, the hybrid file will have timestamps associated with it from the system that'll just say when it was last, uh, you know, when it was created, but that should be around when the operating itself, operating system itself was installed. Um, and then, you know, it'll have like when it was last modified. So that's a potential timestamp that might be of interest. I don't have it available here. It would be in a file listing. Not under the keyword search and the text fragmentation. No, it's not available from this report. Okay. So when we're looking at now number one. Do you have a URL here? Yes, there is a URL here. It was recovered again from the unallocated space. So when we're talking about unallocated space, <laughs> is this a search term query or text fragment that actually pulled the whole URL so you have context around that word? 
This one does have some, some more context. You can see the, the actual website here. So uh, presumably it's Hills, Hillsborough Clerk website, um, public record. But there's also the query in equals and then the actual keyword hit there. And uh, then there appears to be um, a possible date here with uh, this percent to F is uh, really just a different way of writing a dash. It's like a hexadecimal re representation of a dash. Let me stop you for a second. URL. When we're looking at that URL and there's a date embedded in it, is that the date the URL was created or the date that the user of the laptop would have gone to that website? Uh, typically, when you see it in a search query like that, it's going to be the like the date of the search, but it may be some... I don't know exactly. It may be like some parameter that you're allowed to search in this particular, um, on this particular website. Maybe you can enter a date field. So it could be that. Like if it has an opportunity, or if the search feature allows you to search for both, you know, a name in equals or, and a date B equals, maybe that date is relevant for some reason. Um, and that was part of the search query itself. Um, so I don't necessarily know if it's when the search was executed or if it was part of the actual search itself on that website. Knowing that you can't say the relevance of any potential date, is there a date embedded in that URL? Uh, there does look to be a date there of 10-24-2010. Meaning um, October 24th of 2010? Yes, presumably. Okay. Let's move on to 107B. Sir. Before you do that, it's 11 o'clock. We're going to have to take our morning break now in order for us to have a sufficient amount of time between uh, lunch and return from the break. So is this a good time to... Yes, uh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, jury, we're going to go ahead and take our morning break. It'll be one of those breaks where we just give you enough time um, and we'll be waiting for you when you come back. Please do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Please do not do any research related to the case. And please avoid any reports of the case outside of the courtroom. All rise for the jury. And the plan is, ladies and gentlemen, since we'll be coming back 11.20-ish uh, or so, we'll go probably an hour and break for lunch around the 12.20 or 12.30 point. Thank you. Trees exit. Everyone may be seated. Ms. Bell, you may step down and enjoy the break. You are still on the stand, so please do not discuss your testimony with anyone. So, Ms. Hodges, approximately uh, how much time even? Well, um, the 45 minutes was not necessarily accurate. Yeah, not really. <laughs> it's all right. So, so I don't know why I'm asking you now for an estimate of how much longer. Oh. Okay. It's going to be some more time. So you're not almost done. No. So then what we'll do is we'll try to get wherever you finish. Okay. Um, we'll break for lunch and come back and do the cross after That's lunch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my bad. I'm Perfect. Way I, 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 yeah, I, I, it's I, not. I told Mr. Escobar, I said uh, she's got a lot more to do because yeah. I know the exhibit she's got to do. Yeah. Get um, it's all right. I'm used, to, I'm used to it. It's not you. It's not just you.
Sergeant, do we know if they're ready for us? They're ready. Wow. Um, Sergeant, are you ready? Defense ready? Excellent. We're all right on time. That's uh, the shortest break that uh, we've had. I don't know what you're doing, Sergeant, but you're doing something well. They're scared of the stripes. That's right. I left my coffee, but I think I'll be all right. Do you want me to get it? Nah, that's all right. You spoke too soon. They're back in line. Ah. No, no, no. You know what? Can you go get me water? By that thing is empty. If you can fill it with water. Okay. That water thing. Thank you. Good yes, she is. Yes, we are. All members of the jury are present and seated. Everyone else may be seated this time. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, welcome back. 
by show of hands, was anybody exposed to anything about this case during the break, or did anybody discuss amongst themselves or with anyone else anything about this case? Excellent. Thank you all very much. We're going to pick up where we left off um, with the direct examination. Ms. Hodges, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. All right, Ms. Bell, we're going to go back to 107B. Um, I believe it's the yep, third search term that we're going to go through. Search term creeper. Let's go kind of an overview and then we'll talk about some of this in detail. For creeper, were these search term, these keyword fragments located in the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. And then I'm going to draw your attention down to the very bottom. So we're seeing this last one here, the search.yahoo.com. What can you tell us about that? Uh, so that particular URL um, or web address was recovered from what's called uh, the file slack of um, the file you see listed there above the keyword hit string. Um, it's a very long looking system file you're seeing. So uh, what that essentially means is there may have been a file or a part of a file that was saved in that location before and then it was deleted and this new file here this Windows, file maps, programs, et cetera, all the way down to the end there, ending with uh, .cdf-ms. That file was then saved in that location, but that file was smaller than the data that was previously present in that location. And so a little bit of that old file still was remaining, and that portion of that old file is where this particular web address was located. Do you see the full web address, or is this a partial web address, or can you tell? Uh, I can't tell for sure if it's a complete web address. Now, when we're looking at that web address, do we have the word creeper plus shot? Yes, and since it does have the Yahoo search uh, URL uh, convention, you see the same P equals, and then the two uh, terms that were part of that search query on Yahoo. Thank you. Search term robbery from 107B. Oh, let me pull it down a little bit. There we go. Still from the unallocated space? Uh, the first one is, and then the, looks let like me two. Stop you. Oh, we're going to get oh, into the second, third one in a second. Okay. So when we're looking at the term ice cream truck driver shot during robbery, what can you tell us about that along with the information surrounding that? Uh, just that it was those words were found next to each other and there looks like there was some sort of URL um, previous to what may be the web page title. Um, not entirely sure you know, where exactly that was saved originally, but it looks like there was a URL that referenced um, what you see there on the download.gannet.edgesuite.net um, followed by uh, a bunch of remaining <laughs> language there and with the possible title you see it ends in that dot htm so that could be a, a web page that was visited or something to that effect um, might have, at some point those words were right next to each other basically and maybe that w ice cream truck driver shot during robbery could have been the title of the web page for example now let's go down to number two and then we'll get to three <coughs> system volume information I don't want to talk specifically about what we're looking at here, but just in general, what does system volume information mean? So that's a location on the, on the drive where uh, Windows operating systems save what's called volume shadow copies. It used to be called restore points back before um, Windows Vista when it was XP and earlier. Um, volume shadow copies are a service that runs in the background. You as a user aren't really aware of it, but there is a portion of the drive saved um, for system processes and system files, kind of like that hyperfile.sys file we talked about earlier. Um, the volume shadow copy service makes little incremental backups. Um, and when I say incremental backups, I mean it grabs a snapshot of what has changed since the last backup. So it's not a full backup of the entire system. It's just what was changed since last time. Um, that feature is put in there uh, by design by Microsoft so that it gives Windows a little more resiliency. Um, let's say you have encounter a problem with your system, it might let you revert back. 
to a previous version of a driver or something like that. Um, or maybe even now you're able to access previous versions of files that you may have saved and changed and you want to revert back to a previous version, you may be able to leverage volume shadow copies to do that. Now when you're looking at a mirrored image of a hard drive and you see something in the system volume information, are you able to essentially fact check that and see if it still exists on the hard drive itself? Uh, well, I know that the words are there. I mean, it's obviously still saved on the hard drive. Uh, I could, there are tools that let you do more analysis to try to reconstruct maybe where that path was um, at the time that volume shadow copy was created. That information is not available from that report, though. Not available here, but when we're talking about volume system information in general, if you're looking at that snapshot in time, that volume system information, can you compare that to what you're seeing on what I'm going to call the active part of the hard drive? Uh, usually the comparison should show that there's been a change. So the, whatever is in the active files, you would expect to maybe not see the same thing in the volume shadow copies because it is capturing um, what has changed since the last backup. So if you're seeing something in the volume system information, but you don't see it in the active file, can you say that that information was deleted? Uh, it could have just been changed, could have been deleted. Um, it could just be, you know, that it was updated, um, but it is possible to revert back to, you know, a deleted file or recover a deleted file from a volume shadow copy. All right, let's move on to the key search term drum magazine under 107B. So this first one here, is this a Yahoo search for the terms Ruger drum magazine? Yes, it appears to be so. Located in the unallocated space? That's correct. Now when we're looking at the second one with the full information there without a URL around it, what's that telling you? Uh, well, just that those words were next to each other. I'm not sure what the context of that was specifically. And then same thing down here when we've got 223 90-round synthetic polymer drum magazine. Is that something that you're seeing in the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. Can you give context to it or just the words are next to each other? Just the words are next to each other. Let me, before we move off of this one, I want to draw your attention down to number six. Picks.gunbroker.com. What is that information there under that subsection six on the drum magazine keyword search? Uh, it looks like there is a URL there and it references what might be like a cached picture from a website. So um, when you visit web pages, they often have pictures that make them pretty, you know, when you go in a visit them, your web browser will actually cache some of those picture files locally on your computer so that the next time you visit that website it loads faster, it doesn't have to download those pictures again, just saves them to your web browser cache. Um, so it could be something that's relating to that, maybe this website was visited and it cached that image with that file name at that URL. Um, it could just be that was a web page that was viewed and that is the source uh, information for a picture that was embedded in that website. It's hard to say. It Fair to say that that website would need to be visited for that information to be in the hard drive at some point. Uh, presumably, it wouldn't just appear on its own. All right. Okay, for law enforcement, keyword search for 107B. Let's start here at the top. HyattGunStore.com. Do we have a URL located in the system volume information for that keyword search law enforcement? Uh, yes, ma'am. And then the, for the second one down, is that also in the system volume information? Yes, ma'am. Are we seeing this as a snapshot in time for when those searches or that information would have been included in the active files? Um, I do have information about when that volume snapshot was created in my notes, if that would be relevant. If you want to refresh your recollection, go ahead. Just look back up at me and let me know when you're ready to go.
so that particular volume shadow copy was created on November 17th and last written on November 20th of 2010. I was going to ask you for November 17th, was that in 2010 as well? Uh, yes. So we're talking about November 17th being what, what does that date mean in reference to this um, keyword search? It just means that this information was saved in that volume shadow copy sometime between those dates. Um, typically the volume shadow copy service would do like a daily routine snapshot, um, sometimes more than once a day, depending on what, how much is happening. It's regulated by the operating system. Um, so it sort of depends a lot on whether or not the computer is actually on and in use, um, what's going on, how much is being changed, with, and then eventually the system only allocates a certain number of, um, or a certain amount of space to the volume shadow copy data, so it'll start purging the older backups um, and just as the new snapshots are captured. So. All right, and this is for Glock. I'm going to show you the bottom of the page because I want to start there. Under item four, Yahoo search results Glock rifle. Is that in the unallocated space? Yes, ma'am. Does that information tell you if that was, in fact, those two words together as a search in Yahoo? That's what it appears to be. Right? And then I want to move a little bit further down and tell me if you need... There, I'll give you number three. When we're seeing the web address is coolcopgear.com, what can you tell from the information you have in front of you about those URLs being associated with the keyword Glock? Um, I think th where the keyword hit actually occurs is somewhere in the middle of that block of text. You'll see where it says uh, GlockWorld.com? Glock World. Yes, ma'am. All right, so why are these other URLs being associated with a keyword hit of GlockWorld.com? Oh, this was just part of a body of text that actually appeared readable, so I just included it all in the in the text fragments report. Um, it's difficult to say since it was, you know, recovered from unallocated, what exactly was going on there. So when we've got coolcopgear.com and glockworld.com, that doesn't mean that they were necessarily searched together. I have, I don't know. Right. For magazine, page 2 of 107B, I'm going to take you down to item 7, was a YouTube how to load an AK-47 drum magazine, a search term located in the unallocated space, or I, sh I should say a keyword term. Yes, ma'am, that keyword was found in the unallocated space. Can you give us any additional information about when, how, or where that search would have occurred? Uh, the hit below it might have a little more context just since it has a URL and it appears to include YouTube as including the actual um, video identifier as part of the URL. Um, obviously, you know, line seven does say YouTube in it as well, so presumably it involved YouTube. All right. Okay, and then last keyword search, silencer from the text fragments. Page one of silencer item one, how to make a silencer.url. What can you tell us about the file path on that? That is actually an active file uh, located, you can see above where it says that big long thing is just first the case number that I've assigned to it, or well, that it's associated with, with FDLE, and then the item number, the agency exhibit number, et cetera. And then... Let uh, me stop, hold on, I'm going to stop you for a second. So we've got agency number, item number, exhibit number. Where do we start getting into what would be the data recovered from the hard drive itself, not a case number you've assigned to it. You're going to want to look at the D slash users slash Michael slash favorites. It really would have been on his operating system, or excuse me, on the laptop's operating system, it would be the C drive, but since it's the second partition, the forensic software assigns it the letter D, um, which is not really pertinent. The gist of it is it's in the users folder, in the Michael user folder, and it's in the favorites folder, which is um, when you bookmark uh, websites in Internet Explorer, it's saved in that location. Okay, so let's talk about this. When we're looking at page, the silencer page one of 107B, there's a lot of information here that may not be readily available when the user's sitting in front of a computer. 
fair? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I missed the first bit. That's fine. So when we're looking at all of this information here, that's going to show up in a different format than if somebody's sitting in front of the laptop opening Internet Explorer. Uh, well, actually, if you're in your Windows user interface and you're on your, in your user folder, you should be able to access the favorites folder and see what's in there. So when you're going into Internet Explorer and you're opening up an Internet browser, is there a either bar across the top or down the side of the screen that's going to list the favorite websites? Yes, those are typically accessible either via some sort of drop down or bar, as you mentioned. When we're looking at item one, page one of the silencer, how to make a silencer.url, is that a tabbed favorite if you went into that Internet Explorer and looked at what was saved as something that was bookmarked or favorited? Yes. All right, let's move on to some of the other exhibits. One oh seven and I haven't shown these two. I'm gonna show defense one oh seven M, one oh seven N, one oh seven O, and one oh seven P. May I approach the witness? You may. All right, let's go. One oh seven M. Do you recognize this and have you seen it before? Yes, ma'am. And it's in the same or substantially same condition as the last time you saw it. It is? 107N. Do you recognize that? Yes. Same or substantially same condition as the last time you saw it? Yes, ma'am. 107O. Do you recognize that? I do. Same or substantially same condition as the last time you saw it? Yes, ma'am. 107P. Do you recognize that? I do. Same or substantially same condition as the last time you saw it? This was the one without page numbers. Yes. Yes. All right. Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence what's been pre marked as States Exhibit 107P, 107O, 107N, and 107M. Any objection? No, Your Honor, no objection. They'll all be admitted at this time. Permission to publish. You may publish. Now, before we get into kind of the content of this, let's start with this first page. So we're seeing a case number here. Is that a case number that is generated by FDLE for your work on this case? Yes, that's the case number that's associated with this um, by the FDLE laboratory. Now, case generated, this Monday, May 18, 2020 date, what does that tell you? Uh, so that's when I use the Axiom software uh, to produce the portable case. Now, back in 2013, the laptop is worked up in the hard drives mirrored. Why is this date different? Uh, so additional analysis was performed in 2020, um, and I received the archives of that hard drive. Res restored them, copied them all over, double-checked that they were still the same exact information, verified that hash value that we talked about a little bit yesterday, if you remember. Um, so I made sure I'm working with the exact same data that I had before. And then I ran um, a newer version of the uh, Axiom. It used to be called Internet Evidence Finder. Now it's called Axiom. Um, when 2013 it was called Internet Evidence Finder. Now it's Axiom and I ran that uh, against the hard drive again for operating system and web-related artifacts. Is Axiom a program, or I mean, in my layman's terms, almost like an app that allows you to take the data that you've recovered from the hard drive and put it into a program or an app that gives you a more user-friendly way to search, filter, 
those kinds of things. Yes, it's really, it has lots of reporting features, but one of the options for me to use when I'm using the forensic tool, which is, again, is called Axiom, I can export it, document reports in PDF or Word or HTML reports that open with a web browser, but one of the options is a portable case. And that portable case takes all of the information I've chosen to include in the report, which in this case was pretty much everything it recovered, um, and then output it in what's called a portable case package, and it has an, a little reader program that goes with it so that the investigator can then launch that reader and view the information very similarly to the user interface of the Axiom software that uh, I get to use in the lab. And it lets you do, gives you a lot more flexibility than say just a document report that you can only, you know, maybe you can do a control F or, you know, a find search like you would in a, a PDF or a Word document. This lets you search like all of the information uh, at once via a little search box. It lets you sort the information by whatever column you choose. Um, you can filter it by date and time. The investigator can add tags if there's something that you know they want to hone in on to do a, a smaller report that's a subset of the information I provided them. Um, it just gives a lot more flexibility to the end user uh, to take that data, review it, pare it down and generate results as, or generate reports as they need. Now when we're looking at report generated and it has a date there, is that essentially the date that the document's just printed? That Yeah, that appears to be the date when it's just exported from the, the portable case. Okay, we're going to go through some of those. I'm not going to go through every page with you, don't worry. Page 6 of States Exhibit 107M. I'm going to see if I can zoom in some to give you... All right. Up here on the top left-hand side, Inter Internet Explorer cache records. What is that telling us? Uh, so I mentioned earlier about when you visit uh, a web page and your web browser might save some of the pictures or maybe video content or what to your local hard drive so the next time you visit it, it loads faster. That's the cache. Um, and in this case, Internet Explorer is just the web browser associated with that cache. So do you have a website that was visited? Uh, this particular URL is... It's yes, it is I there. It, sorry. And uh, <laughs> yes, there is a URL there and it reads... Do you, would you like me to read it or no? Let me do this. I'm going to have you stand up because every okay. time I touch it, it tries to autofocus, which is going to make this take longer. So go ahead, stand up, and I want you to point to the Internet website that was... Um, associated with this record. So there's the URL, which is just the web address. Um, and then can you read that web address for me, because I'm not sure that everybody can see it. It's http colon forward slash forward slash www.blockpost.com forward slash f-a-v-i-c-o-n dot i-c-o. All right, so I'm going to just zoom in on this a little bit since we don't need this stuff on the top right now. So when we're looking at, hold on. So what's that last modify compared to last checked? I want to talk about those two boxes and give me the information that you're able to obtain from those two boxes in comparison to each other. So when Internet Explorer visits or is used to visit this website, it's going to check with the actual web server hosting this website and say, has this picture been updated since the last time I downloaded it? Because if so, I'll refresh it and save a new one to the cache, right? So it's checking this and it's saying, all right, the last modified by the web server was back in 2009, and I last checked it, you know, I being Internet Explorer, on November 16, 2010 at 10.45 p.m. You know, so this is saying, all right, it, it didn't need to refresh that icon. It was the same as it was because it hasn't changed since December 2nd, 2009. Miss Bell, when we're looking at last checked by local host, that box right over here, and the date that we see, does that date of November 16, 2010 at 1045 p.m. associate when a user from this laptop would have gone to that website for the last time? Uh, presumably, yes. All right. And then are you able to see this information sourced from the system volume information? Yes, it's from a, that volume shadow copy we previously discussed that was created on November 17th and 
2010, and then last modified November 20th, I believe. Did you see this file in the active files? Um, no, I do not believe this was recovered in the web cache, of the active web cache. Does that mean that this <coughs> internet cache going to glockpost.com was deleted? <coughs> um, it's very possible. You know, in Internet Explorer, you are, as a user, able to delete. Uh, you're able to clear your internet history, and you are able to do that in a variety of ways. One, you can clear all of it. Um, you can <coughs> just select maybe the last hour, the last seven days, the past day, um, it gives you some flexibility there. Um, and then you are also able to, I guess, as a line item, delete specific things from the browser history if you'd like to. Um, but typically the options are last hour, last 24 hours, last week, or all of it. Um, it gives you a range usually. Okay, let's move on to page 9 of 107M. I'm going to show you the top part first. Internet Explorer favorites. Is this um, essentially a category of what we were talking about earlier, where if you open up an internet browser, this is going to be listed across the top or down the side as favorited websites or bookmarked websites? Yes. So when we're looking at these records under, it's on page nine, do you have a list of the internet websites that had been saved and bookmarked by a user on that laptop? Uh, this folder here, the users Michael favorites folder that you see here at the source, uh, that is going to be where you find uh, the particular websites that have been favorited by that user with Internet Explorer. So that first record is what's the favorite name associated with record one? How to make a silencer. Okay, I'm going to move this down a little bit. We're going to work through record two and down. So record two, what was the favorite name? Sighting in a rifle scope, proper rifle scope settings, beer dope. Still in that um, user Michael favorites root location. Yes, ma'am. And then record three. What's that one? HTTP dash dash www.aviation job search. Still under that uh, Michael favorites. Uh, Fop half? Yes. Record four, is that also an aviation job search website? Uh, yes. And same thing with five? Yes. These aviation job site ones, though, it looks like actually were in a little subfolder, or, or it was in a subfolder under favorites. Um, so if you had a bookmark list, it, you might have a folder, uh, a subfolder under your bookmarks where you like keep things that maybe you, they're all the same topic or something. You know, I have one for recipes and things. Um, that might be like, it looked like there was a boulder called links and it, the aviation job search one was in there. Okay. Still within the favorites list though. So now let's go to page 11 of 107M, Internet Explorer Main History. And I want to draw your attention to, let's start with record one. Do you have a well, before we get into that, when we're talking about Internet Explorer main history, what does that mean? So Internet Explorer actually used to keep several different files containing the Internet history. They were all actually called the same back in the day, index.dat, and they were just kept in different folders. Um, and there was one for main, one for daily, one for weekly. It wasn't the <coughs> most efficient system since there was a lot of duplication, um, but the main was theoretically supposed to be the uh, global file that kept all of it, and then daily and weekly were your your uh, subsets of the overall internet history. So when we're looking at record one, do we have a website that was visited? Yes, ma'am. And then is it the www.glockpost.com forward slash forums forward slash show thread? Yes, ma'am. And then the last visited date and the last visited second timestamp, so the two boxes below that, with the November 16th, 2010. What information is that telling us? Uh, that's typically the last time that website was visited with, with Internet Explorer. Using the laptop that you mirrored the hard drive from? Yes. Did that website have a web page title that was captured as part of the records that you were able to observe? Yes, ma'am. And what was it? 
here it says Taurus, Ford, Slash, Corvetta, 92, <coughs> replacement barrels, question mark, dash, block, post. So after replacement barrels, you've got a question mark. Does that have significance when you're doing your analysis? Uh, not for me. I think that is just part of the web page title. Does it show up as that um, with that question mark when someone's looking at the internet page, or is this more of the back end data? No, this should be what it actually shows up. Um, you know, when you have like a multiple tabs open and you have like a little title that appears at the top of the tab in the internet browser. That's what that is. That's that web page title there. So. And then, are you finding this in the system volume information? Uh, yes, this one was in that same volume shadow copy. Did you see? the Taurus Beretta replacement barrel web page title in the active files. Uh, I did not. And does that mean that this internet history had been deleted? Uh, that is a plausible explanation. <clears throat> Record two. Do we have a web page title, Yahoo search results for Taurus handgun barrel replacement? Yes, ma'am. Now, why is the web page title that? Um, the web page title is more dictated by the actual web page itself, so it's just displaying um, this is the actual URL up here. So the title is just the what Yahoo assigns it when it presents the search results that have been entered via this query here. You can see the actual query terms. Well, let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah. When we're looking at the query terms, is this a, a search that's done through Yahoo? Uh, yes, ma'am. And are the search terms Taurus, handgun, barrel, replacement, all together? Yes, ma'am. And are you able to see that based on the plus signs between each of those words? Yes, ma'am. So when we're looking at record two, what was the date that that search was made in Yahoo? Uh, that appears as 11-16-2010. At what time? 10, 45, and 26 seconds. And where did you recover this information from? Also in the volume shadow copy. Did you see this information in the active mm -hmm. internet history? I did not. All right, we're gonna skip ahead to page 15. I'm gonna show you the title first, <coughs> link file, L-N-K files. What does that mean? Uh, so link files are shortcut files that are created when you open a, a file on your Windows computer. And again, they're designed to make your life easier, uh, give you a quick shortcut to uh, your files you've been recently using. So uh, if you ever go to like your start menu and recent documents or whatnot, those are link files that appear that let you quickly access um, the target file instead of having to browse through the whole folder structure and, and find the file that way. Or if you save a, a shortcut to a file on your desktop, something like that, that's also going to be a link file. It's basically just a pointer. All right, so when we're looking at record one, tell me if you need me to back out to give you more data here. Record one under the link files, what are you able to say about that linked path? So that shows where that particular target file was saved. So here we can see the target file is the title or the file name is us 200501263.pdf. So it's a PDF document. And it tells us it was in the documents folder on the desktop of the Michael user account. Now let's go down to target file last accessed, June 11th of 2010. What does that information tell you? Uh, well, on a Windows Vista system, usually not much, but only because it does not maintain the last access timestamps by default. But you can see they're all the same. Uh, so that should typically tell us that this was created on June 11th, 2010, at 11.05, 11 p.m. on that particular computer in this location, that, that documents folder on the desktop for the micro user account. When you're doing your analysis, are you able to say what that document is that was saved? Even though you can't say it from necessarily looking at the, the document itself here, do you know what document that is? Um, it was one of the documents we reviewed in an earlier exhibit. Um, one of the patent, a? One of the U.S. patent okay. documents. I don't remember which one.
Page 18. MRU opens forward slash saved files. What's that category? So this is yet another system <coughs> feature of Microsoft Windows. It has what is called a registry, which is sort of like the brains of the operation, and it keeps track of the goings-on of the system, the user, the configuration of um, all the system processes, the in installed programs, how they're configured, the user uh, accounts, whether or not they have passwords configured, that kind of thing. Um, and it actually has what's called this, this mtuser.dat file. This file is the registry file associated with a particular user account. In this case, there was, again, the only, only the one user account, the Michael user account. Um, and it does, one of the things it keeps track of is recently uh, open and saved or saved files. And here we also, again, see that same uh, file name and file path here of it being located on, in the documents folder on the desktop. Is record one one of the U.S. Uh, patents for a silencer? Uh, <coughs> yes. Is record two one of the U.S. patents for a silencer? Yes. All right, network profiles, page 21 of 107M. What's a network profile? Uh, so this is another feature that the Windows registry is in charge of, as it were, is remembering uh, when you connect to a wireless network, it's, and you ask it to, it asks you, to, do you want to save this network and maybe connect to it again automatically in the future, that kind of thing. Um, the registry is where that information is going to be saved on your computer, um, in Windows at least. And it's going to keep track of what that network name was and uh, the MAC address or the blind SSID. Um, so that is just uh, this little, it's letters and numbers mixed together, but it's a, it's a hardware identifier for that particular network enabled device. Okay, so let me stop you for a second. When we're talking about a MAC ID, is that a unique number that will associate a device? to yes. it, what it actually is. Yes, it, there are ways that it's, it can be spoofed and it's actually much more common. It's built into your iPhones now pretty much. Um, so, but back for a router or a wireless access point, um, it's still not really a thing. <laughs> you, this is, it would be unique to that. It, it would still present, um, Let me, ask it, let me ask it this way for you. Do you have a unique identifying code associated with a hotspot device? Uh, so the hotspot that was introduced earlier uh, does have a, an, a unique MAC address associated with it. Um, I'm going to show you States Exhibit 203. Is this the hotspot that you were asked to do basic analysis on? Uh, yes, I didn't do okay. any. There was no. I didn't do any extraction of data or anything like that. It was just. We're going to get to all that in a little bit. But when we're talking, I'm going to talk specifically about the hotspot right now. Okay. Can you say that this is a unique hotspot that you are able to give a unique identification number to? Yes, it does have a MAC address specifically associated with it. Okay. So now, when we look at the network profile records, are you able to look at those records to see within the computer system what computer, what internet devices this computer connected to? So yes, this computer saved uh, a wireless access point with this network name, the Verizon MiFi 2200 7364 secure, and it also had this MAC address, which is consistent with that MAC address. Now when we're talking about, I don't care necessarily at this point about <coughs> which device it may be, but when that laptop connects to a hotspot or an internet device, do you have the ability to see in the records whether it has to be manually connected or if it automatically connects? Uh, yes, it is actually captured in the Windows Registry network profile entry here, whether or not the user opted to auto connect to that network. And you can see here that the connection mode is set to auto. So when we've got it set to auto, 
if the hotspot is turned on and plugged into the laptop, does the laptop immediately search for and connect to that hotspot without the user having to initiate that? Uh, it should, as long as it, it doesn't necessarily have to be plugged into the laptop, it just needs to be in range. Um, but as long as the hotspot's powered on um, and the laptop's wireless network adapter is enabled, so in other words, they haven't put in airplane mode or something like that, um, then it should auto connect just like <coughs> your laptop would when you fire it up at home and your home router is available. And we'll get into the hotspot in just a little bit, but I want to talk specifically about these records. When you're looking at these records, can you tell not just that the laptop has connected to a hotspot, but in fact the exact <coughs> specific hotspot it has connected to? Yes, that is captured in a different portion of yet another Windows operating system feature called Event Logs. All right, so when we're looking at the date and times of connections, do you have it both in this document and then in others that we're going to get to, do you have a event log of when the hotspot would have connected to the laptop, when the hotspot would have been disconnected to the laptop, and the date and time associated with that? So this particular system had a wireless um, auto configuration event log that captured that information yesterday. What does parse search queries mean? So we looked at a little bit of those when we talked about you know, the Yahoo search results web pages that we saw in the text fragments reports or um, in some of the earlier internet history related uh, information that was just reviewed uh, where it had the P equals. Uh, so the Axiom software is going to search the hard drive for all the web browser related activity it can find, but once it does recover these URLs uh, and say, okay, here's this web browser activity, it's going to go a step further and it calls it refined results where it tries to break out things that it thinks might be worth looking at further just to kind of help out the examiner or investigator or whomever. Um, and one of those things is parsed search queries. So Axiom's going through all the web history it has recovered and based on certain conventions we know about like the P equals and then term plus term on Yahoo or in Google it would be Q equals or K equals sometimes. Just different websites have different um, search query conventions of how the URLs look when a search is performed. Uh, Axiom is programmed to identify those and pull them out and report them separately in a little subcategory that it calls parsed search queries. All right, so when we're looking at this, we have search term here, Sig Mosquito. Is that the term that is searched on record one? Yes, ma'am. Now, when we've got the artifact down here, i.e. in private recovery URLs, what does that mean? Uh, that's Internet Explorer in private slash recovery. Um, when you do like that, you can do like private mode in Internet Explorer like you can with other browsers. Um, and some of that information still gets tracked locally, even though it's not visible in your regular internet history. It's still being saved in other places, sometimes <coughs> on the on the website. So what's the benefit to the user of privacy mode? Um, really just anyone else using the computer in regular mode isn't going to see your browsing history, but it's really, that's only the only thing that's impacted. It's not saved in the regular browsing history, what websites you visit um, when it's in that mode, but it's still visible to, you know, say like your internet service provider. Um, Let me interrupt you for a second. So from the user, a person sitting in front of the laptop, if you're in privacy mode on the internet, does your internet search history show up to anyone else who may be using that laptop? Not if they're just looking at the regular internet history mode. They'd have to do some digging to find that. Now when we're looking at record one, is this data found in the volumes, the system volume information? Uh, yes. Was this search found in the active files? No, I don't believe it was. Does that mean it's deleted? Uh, that's a plausible explanation. All right. Record two. Is this a search term for infrared goggles? Uh, yes, it appears to be so. Also done in privacy mode? Uh, it does seem to be. All right. And then we're going to go, and a lot of these records, some of these, they repeat themselves, don't they? Yes, that's not uncommon. Okay. Okay, 
page 23, record 7, parse search query, is another search term, commando MK45. Yes, and we see that same P equals and word plus word in the Yahoo URL. When we're looking at the URL date time, 11-22-2010 at 12.31 p.m., is that the date that that search was made? Uh, yes, it should be. In privacy mode? Yes, it appears to be so. And was this record found in the volume system information? Yes, also sourced from a volume shadow copy. And was that file in the active files? I don't believe I saw it there. <coughs> All right, let's go to page 29. Record number 34, and then we'll go to 35. So I'll show you the top of the page, parse search queries. Record 34. Is the search term arms list searched on November 17, 2010? Yes, that appears to be the date. In Yahoo? Yes, ma'am. And then was this done in privacy mode or in regular mode? Uh, this appears to be just the regular Internet Explorer daily history. And was this record recovered from the system volume information? Also from the volume shadow copy. Now, was this record seen in the active files? I don't recall what it was. Let me see if I can do this without making less of it. Record 35. Bellini's Supernova Pistol Grip. Was that searched in Yahoo? Yes. On 11 17 2010 at 750? Yes. And was this record recovered from the system volume information? It was. Was it seen in the active history? <clears throat> uh, I don't recall seeing it there. Page 30, record 36. <coughs> Taurus handgun barrel replacement. Search through <coughs> Yahoo? Yes, ma'am. And was this recovered from the system volume information? Yes. Searched on November 16th of 2010? Yes. Into evidence already. Okay. Yes, I just want to check. <coughs> All right, 107 I'm going to show you your cover page for this. Same dates and times, same case number? Yes, ma'am. All right. You can, you might as well probably still stay standing and have you walk up there in a second. Showing you page four. What does Windows event logs mean? Uh, so the Windows event logs, as briefly mentioned earlier, uh, are records that the Windows operating system is keeping in the background of various, there's application event logs, there's system event logs, there's security event logs, and on this particular system, uh, there's uh, wireless <coughs> network auto config event log. Uh, but what they do is track the activities going on or the events occurring on that system, and they're really designed just to provide troubleshooting um, in case, you know, they're keeping a record of what's going on. If your system crashes, you can review the event logs, for example, and maybe see what was happening right before that, um, and either fix the problem or avoid doing it again, um, that kind of thing. Do these event logs, and specifically record one, relate to 203, the hotspot that was recovered in that laptop bag? Uh, yes, this, this does. Does this record show that the laptop in States Exhibit 107 connected to this hotspot, States Exhibit 203. It does. Now, before we get into kind of the details of this record, I want to talk <coughs> generally about a hotspot. What is a hotspot? A uh, hotspot is just something, it's a device that allows you to take uh, cellular connectivity and turn it into a wireless network access point. So your laptop doesn't have a cellular 
capability, right? You can't connect to you know, the Verizon cellular network on it, or you couldn't in 2010, right? Um, but your phone could, and you could access the internet through your phone via the Verizon cellular network. So instead of, <coughs> you know, trying to use your phone as a hotspot, which doesn't have maybe the best battery ever because it has lots of other features, a hotspot is sold specifically for that purpose. It allows access to the cellular network for the purposes of using the internet, and it allows devices that don't have that capability to access it like it would any other wireless access point. So, you know, the, the router, the free Wi-Fi router at Starbucks or the airport, whatever it is that lets, you know, your laptop will connect to the wireless network and access the internet through that. The hotspot's just serving that function um, just with battery capability. Um, and it's portable, you can take it wherever. <coughs> now, to back up a little bit, a desktop computer, not a laptop, but a desktop computer, is that either off of a wireless router in a home or off of hardwired to the internet in a home? Uh, I mean, desktop computers used to pretty much rely primarily on the hardwired connectivity via just that ethernet cable that used to plug in, or it used to be like a DSL phone cable. Um, so when we're talking about a desktop computer being hardwired to, you know, it's fixed, it's not going anywhere. Does a hotspot give a user the flexibility of not being in a specific location when they're using the hotspot? Oh yeah, a lot of people use them either because there is no internet service available to them, but they can get cellular service in their area, um, or so they can travel with it. They can, anywhere you can get cellular service, that is a that is a prerequisite. Obviously, if you can't get cellular service, that is not going to help you much. Um, but that is the purpose of the device. So if so, if Verizon, if we have a Verizon hotspot, if Verizon cell phone service is available in a location, will the hotspot work? Yes, it should. So if you're in the middle of a national park in your car and you have Verizon cell phone <coughs> service, can you access the internet? You should be able to. So when we're talking about a hotspot device, does this allow for a laptop or whatever this is going to be connected to, to now become mobile? Yes. So when we're looking at the records here in 107.0, oh, record one, do you see that the hotspot has connected to the laptop? Uh, yes, you can. The details are actually in this event data section that make it a little uh, more clear, but you can see that there's a connection. Do you know for sure that it states Exhibit 203, the, hot, the Verizon hotspot, that this specific hotspot connected to States Exhibit 107, the laptop in this case? Do you know it's those two devices that connected to each other? So, yes, if you look down here, you want me to move it over? Over, yeah, it's under here. Uh, you actually have to keep going. Right here, you can see the peer MAC address right here, as well as this SSID here. Those are both consistent with what appears on that hotspot. So when we're talking about the capabilities of the laptop to access the internet through the hotspot, can that be done anywhere that we've got cellular active, cellular service? Yes, you're on. I asked and answered. So I'll move on. November 25th, 2010, 118 a.m. What does that mean in terms of this hotspot? Uh, that is the time that the event was captured um, in the event log, documenting the connection of the laptop to that wireless access point, the Verizon Wi-Fi hotspot. So when we're seeing the laptop connected to the hotspot at 1.18 a.m., do you also have records to show when that hotspot was disconnected from the laptop? The event log captures that as well. All right. Showing you page seven of 107.0, oh, tell me if you want record five or if I need to go up a little bit higher. Oops, this is record five, show the disconnect time of that hotspot from the laptop. Uh, yes, it, the event logs are very extremely detailed, so it shows like 
it'll actually show like wireless association or disconnection, whatnot, and then it'll say the security stop that's associated with the disconnect. So, so um, eleven twenty five twenty ten two twenty nine a.m. was the wireless hotspot disconnected from the laptop. Yes, there appears to have been a disconnection in it then. I know it's not reflected in these records, but do you have other records that show when that hotspot was connected to the laptop again? Uh, you mean later after that? Yeah. Um, I believe there was activity starting around like 153 or so in Is the it afternoon. Reference in 107P? It should appear there. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to show you 107P. What is this document we're looking at? So this is a selection of the information from all the event logs. Uh, we saw earlier, you saw all those different fields and there was that big block that said like, event data and it was long and it had lots of little carroty looking things in it, <coughs> little, little brackets. Um, this is sort of a zoomed out view of the event log information where it's just what was the event ID, what time is the, what was the timestamp, and then a brief description of that event. Not the full detail that we saw in that one big block there where we found the MAC address and the, the SSID for the hotspot, but just a bird's eye view, if you will. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead. And it's focused on a specific time range, I believe. All right, I am skipping ahead to record number 337. Put down here, it's the very last one on this page. 337 at 1125 2010 118 is that where we're seeing the record to show that the hotspot has connected to the laptop right these two are, are showing that the uh, that's the event associated with the hotspot being connected to do you have records to show that the hotspot was disconnected at 1229 in this document as well was it 1229 sorry what I said 12, I meant 229 sorry yes I believe it was 229 And then, do you also have a record in 107P, but you can just testify to it, that the laptop was actually shut down? Uh, yeah, there does show a system shutdown initiated, and then um, there's just like no activity after that for uh, almost 12 hours or so. What time was the system shut down? Do you want to look believe it was around 2.32 a.m.? So 2.32 a.m. laptop is shut down. Yes. Not just lid closed, but you can tell from the data that's recovered, the laptop was physically shut down. Yes, and then after mm -hmm. that, there's a startup event. And when's that startup event? Uh, that was later in the afternoon, closer to 2 p.m. It was one something in the afternoon, maybe 50, 150 or so in the afternoon. Same date, 11, 25, 2010, but way in the afternoon? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. May I have just a moment, Josh? Yes. <coughs> As part of your work, were you given cell phones to do a forensic download on? Yes, there were two cell phones, I believe. When you're doing a forensic download on a cell phone, um, do you dump all the data off of that phone onto a disk with a program that can run it? Yes, in a nutshell, whatever is accessible. I know we talked a little bit about this yesterday in terms of the process of how that's done. For your work on the cell phones, once you dump that data onto a disk, do you give the disk to law enforcement? Yes, ma'am. You alluded to some of this earlier, but you don't know the details of a case when you're doing your forensic download, right? Uh, no, other than just like the search terms or the offense date that's provided, that's all I know. In this case, when you dumped those cell phones and forensically downloaded them, did you give the disk to law enforcement to let them review and analyze them? They go back to the agency that submitted the original evidence. I turn it back into our evidence intake section at the FDLE lab, and then it's collected by the submitting agency. May I have a moment, Judge? Absolutely. Um, one thing, so I forgot to bring this up too. When we're looking at 
the 118 to 229 time frame on November 25th of 2010, when that hotspot's connected to the laptop. You know what I'm referring to? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to split it up into two categories, and I want you to clarify for me if I'm saying this wrong. User human driven activity, and then background computer doing its own thing activity. Is that a fair way to kind of split up this information? Yeah, that's fair. When we're looking at human user driven activity on the laptop between 118 and 229, the morning of November 25th, what records do you have to show that there was user driven activity at 1.45 a.m.? So one of the things that the event logs tracks is uh, user account logons. Um, so when you actually load up Windows and you know click into your user account or log in with a password if it's protected, um, it noted it documents that a, the account was logged into, and it also documents the logon type. Um, in this case, there were two records: one for the logon and one for the log off, um, both of which indicated a logon type of two. Uh, which is consistent in Windows, like Microsoft captures that, that that's the user interaction. So the user interaction at 1.45 a.m., was that going to a website? Uh, I'd have to see the report. I which think, report the, do you want? There was some internet history related content, I guess, back, uh, I think it was in the privacy, <coughs> the Internet Explorer privacy mode. Take a look at this. I'm going to give you all but one of seven. So. Does the website Plenty of Fish refresh your recollection on any of that? Uh, there was a URL related to uh, pl Plenty of Fish, or it appeared to be Plenty of Fish. When you looked at that record and that website for 1.45 a.m., did it show that there was essentially what I'm calling human-driven activity? Somebody is going to that website at 1.45 a.m.? Um, that's the most logical explanation, yes. Was there a record at 2.01 a.m. showing someone was going to a website, Plenty of Fish? Tell me if you need a second to go through this. Yeah, it's going to take me a minute just to find which, <laughs> which one had I'm going to ask you another question because that probably will direct some of your search in the documents. At 2.11 a.m., was there a Google Analytics hit to Plenty of Fish? Um, I do recall there being a, a Google Analytics cookie-related artifact that was recovered with a timestamp around that time. So a 2.11 a.m. timestamp with a Google Analytics cookie, is that computer-driven or human-driven? Um, typically that's associated with web browser usage, which is a user activity usually. So when you're looking at that user activity, is the last time in that 118 to 229 window, the last time we're seeing human driven activity, is it at 211 a.m.? Um, I don't know if that's the last uh, user activity overall. Um, because there, like I said, there was like a, a log off event, that type of thing. Right. So I'm separating those out. We've got the oh. log off event, the, the computer shut down at 2.30. But when I'm talking about human driven activity between that 2.29, so from 118 to 2.29, during that window of time, do we have three hits at 1.45 a.m., 2.01 a.m., and 2.11 a.m. at the Plenty of Fish website? I mean, I know I recall seeing the Plenty of Fish related content. I just can't, like, confirm the dates and times specifically from memory. Uh, there's an armslist.com cookie that's carved at 2 a.m. So let me stop you and let me ask Here's you about that. Let's go back to the arms list for a second. At 2.08 a.m., do we have a cookie being placed on the computer from armslist.com? Uh, yes, there was a there were cookies related to armslist.com. And is a cookie placed on a computer after a user, a human, has gone to that website and the website has downloaded a small text file to the user's computer to track things? 
Yes, that's the purpose of a cookie is to just so it's a tiny little text file that gets saved on your computer that lets websites track your session, what you're doing on that website, um, what you've put in your shopping cart, that kind of thing. So and then Google uses it to track how you get from website to website. And uh, that's what those Google Analytics cookies are for. And website hosts will participate in the Google Analytics program so that they can get better insight into how people are using their website and getting to it so they can market more effectively. And that's basically how Google makes a lot of its money. So when we're looking at Google Analytics cookies and website generated cookies, are you seeing an armslist.com cookie being placed on the laptop at 2.08 a.m. on November 25th, 2010? Yes. Does that suggest to you that that website has been visited at 2.08 a.m. on 11-25-2010? Uh, yes. And the same thing for Plenty of Fish. If you're seeing web activity or a cookie at 1.45 a.m., 2.01 a.m., and 2.11 a.m., does that suggest to you that a user, human-driven activity, has gone to that website? Uh, yes. When we're looking at the records for the 118 to 229 time frame is that 211 plenty of fish Google <coughs> Analytics cookie the last human driven record you see prior to the laptop being shut down at 230 it could be I, I honestly like don't have all of the information in front of me like to be definitive about it um, if it's the last URL, it might be the indication of the last time the user was actually interacting with the web browser on the computer at that around that time. So as you sit here today, you can say that 2.11, there was web activity, and that 2.20 or 2.30, the laptop was shut down. Yes, ma'am. Right. I'll take this. Let me just check and make sure there's nothing else, and then I should be okay. I'll give you yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, just let's go ahead and break for lunch. I'm not going to pass the witness. You're not going to pass the witness. Okay. So, yes, all right, yes, all right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to break for lunch. Please do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or anyone else. Please do not do any research related to the case, and please avoid all reports of the case outside of the courtroom. Giving you my normal hour and 15 minutes puts us at 1.55, so we're going to go ahead and round it up till 2 o'clock rather than uh, that. So we'll get to, but I do want you to uh, keep in note during this break that um, depending on how we go this afternoon, there is a possibility we'll go past 5. I don't plan on keeping you anywhere near 6 o'clock because that's a long day when you've been been here since nine o'clock, actually before nine o'clock. But depending on where we're at with witnesses, we may go past five today. So thank you all. All rise for the jury. Jury has exited. Everyone may be seated. Ms. Bell, you may step down uh, again, this time for the lunch break, um, but you are still on the stand, so please do not discuss your testimony with anyone. And as you heard me tell the jury, we'll plan on picking up about 2 o'clock, so if you get here just a few minutes before, we'll put you back on the witness stand before we bring them in at 2. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're very welcome. And have a nice lunch. Anything from the state? No, you are. Um, now, Ms. Hodges, can I assume, though, that even if you're, you may be done or you're at least just about done, and so we will start the cross soon after 2 o'clock? If I have anything else, it's going to be very, very brief. All right, that, that's, exact, that's what I suspected. Um, so um, defense, uh, after the lunch break, we'll start the cross. Do you have, I, not in any way am I holding you to it, but any rough idea how long? I'm just wondering for, you know, the end of the day purposes. Yeah, sure. It's been getting longer and longer as she's been testifying. Yeah. Honestly, I'm guessing... A solid hour and a half, maybe into two hours. Okay, so if we start back at two, that might get us till four and then a redirect. I just trying to figure out if we're going to have time for another witness, even if we go past five. Judge, and I don't know. And we may 
the next witness I have is Luca when he oh. is an all day. Yeah. I just thought we would get through this a little bit quicker. Yeah. Um, so I need to, I need to rethink that because yeah. we have a witness that I have to put on tomorrow that we flew in. Okay. And so I don't want to interrupt Lugo for this witness that we flew in because he's also flying out tomorrow. And I yeah. feel like he's going to be an all day witness. Lugo's going to be an all day witness. I, I mean, I don't disagree with that. Um, but. The situation we're in today, there's not much I can do. No I'm willing to go past five, but I don't know that that's going to benefit you it putting Lugo on for problem. an hour between it, four and five. It won't solve our issue because yeah. I'm flying in the person from the Roni. Like, he's flying in tomorrow and leaving tomorrow night. Yeah. So I can't. I don't think I can break up Lugo. I mean, if you all agree, I know that you've agreed to allow some of their experts, if necessary, to testify out of uh, order. So, I mean, it's, it's up to you all. I, I'm not going to get involved in um, presenting your cases. I know that. But um, for the afternoon, though, I mean, I, I don't care if, if you don't have anything to put on if we finish with this witness at 4 or 4.30 um, and you don't have something short, or even if I'm willing to go past 5.00, um, I understand Lugo is probably not an option, but if you don't have something to do instead, I don't mind sending them home before five o'clock. Okay. Judge, we'll figure out if we right. have somebody shorter. Talk, we can yeah, and, okay. and and certainly, you know, you're welcome to talk to each other too about things. Anything from the defense? Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Have a great lunch. <laughs> okay.
very much. No, you don't. You take, take your... Absolutely. No, 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 no. That is perfectly fine. I love when I see stuff like that. Oh, it's colder in here, I think, than ever before. <laughs> Mr. Escobar, does that TV have a heater on it? <laughs> yeah. You want to feel my hands? No, I don't want to feel your hands. <laughs> That's the reason I'm saying it. I said it's colder in here than ever before. That's right, Chief. Right, yeah. That's right, Chief. <laughs> I will see. I'm going to be getting a lot of that. I'll put that up towards you know the top of the list. <laughs> oh, I know. When I walked out this morning, I was like, wait a minute, what happened? Where did I? Thank God. Christina, go get me that little heater that's right behind my desk. It's on the it's on the credenza behind my desk. It's still in the box. That little one that you plug into like the. Let's, let me get. I'm gonna try this one. It's never it's been ever been out before. I just plug it into a USB. Yeah, yeah. The one fish that I hate. The one fish. Oh, salmon. Why? I don't know what it is about salmon. Maybe, maybe the oily, you know. Uh, so I said, okay, so I gotta eat it. <laughs> so I ate it. Ah. <laughs> so that was a nice. It's a nice view up there, you know. Oh my God, it is. It's, it's beautiful. A beautiful view, isn't it? Well, I've, I like they. They introduced you as what a professional international fisherman or something. Yeah.
John, or do you have any? Um, I have two questions and then I'm finished. All right, and then we'll turn uh, directly to the cross. So we're going to go check on the jury now. I know that they were all here, but we'll make sure they're all ready. If they are, you can bring them in. The jury is present and seated. Everyone else may be seated at this time. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. Welcome back. Did everyone enjoy their lunch break? Very good. I don't know what I would do if one of you said no. I don't know what I have to inquire further, but uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all of you again for your time and your service. Let me ask you, though, whether anyone discussed anything about or was exposed to anything about this case during the lunch break by show of hands. Again, thank you all very much. We are going to turn back to the state who was uh, finishing up the direct examination of the witness, and the witness is still under, um, uh, still sworn from before. Okay, Mr. Bell, we were talking about internet usage on the laptop between that 118 and 229 time frame on November 25th, 2010. Yes, follow me. Okay. When you're looking at the internet usage on that laptop between those two time frames, that time window, is 2.11 a.m. on November 25th, 2010, the last time you're seeing internet activity prior to that laptop being shut down at approximately 2.29, 2.30? Uh, that appears to be the timestamp that is last reported in the Axiom results. And is 2.30 when the laptop, a.m., when the laptop shut down? Approximately 2.30 a.m., yes, ma'am. Right. No further questions. Thank you. All right. Cross examination. Yes. I just have a moment to grab the mic. Absolutely. You take your time. Anything you need to arrange or. Thank you. talking earlier today about the one user name being user Michael, is that correct? Uh, correct. The one user account that was configured on the computer was Michael, was the username. And were you aware that Michael Keatley, that he lived with his mother and father? Uh, no, I didn't really know much about the, sub the subject at the time of the analysis or anything. Um, in your experience, is it unusual for multiple people to use a laptop, a computer, uh, under a single user name? I don't know if I'd call it unusual, but I mean, I feel like probably now it's more common for people to password protect and have individual accounts, but, um, you know, I don't judge to each their own, you know, it's certainly common, I guess, for people to have family computers if they've got, like, you know, 
kids around or something like that too maybe um, maybe they just have one family user account set up I don't know I don't know that it's necessarily uncommon but uh, this was the situation for this particular device right and certainly we're here in 2023 and back in 2010 it's not uncommon to have a single family uh, a family laptop correct I mean if, especially if that's the only computer in the house I wouldn't be surprised now and I think believe you said that this uh, laptop and this was uh, this laptop uh, was not password protected correct Yes, there, it, the user account uh, had a blank password, so no set password. Now, uh, you also talked a lot about unallocated uh, space, and I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit about um, unallocated space. Uh, you were asked some questions, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit about some photographs, and, and you were asked some questions about were those photographs uh, deleted because they were in unallocated space? And, and you, your response was, that's plausible. Uh, so when I hear the word plausible, I think, well, there's another explanation for that. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably, in most cases, the best explanation. Um, I just don't want to equivocally, you know, unequivocally rule out, you know, some other... I don't know, random occurrence or something that may be accident. And also we can't, even if it is deletion, we can't attribute intent necessarily just from the fact that it exists in the unallocated space. I don't know if it was intentionally deleted, um, if it was, say, like part of clearing a web browser cache. You know, you're not necessarily individually deleting that specific picture file, um, but by virtue of clearing the internet cache at that time, uh, that file ends up getting deleted, for example. Well, isn't it true that the browser saves everything you click on, including photos you click on? It saves those photos in the unallocated uh, space or temporary storage, or as you called it earlier, not saved yet. So it's not so much that they, they don't save anything to the unallocated space, because the unallocated space is actually just it's essentially any of the space that's not currently associated with a saved file or folder. So what it is saving to is, like I said, the cache, um, and it may save some files in the temporary internet files directory um, or in the temp folder, uh, which is a different location, but it's, that's all under, um, the temporary internet files are also gonna be under that user account uh, under the app data folder, um, and they, will also, those are not necessarily going to be cleared when you clear your internet history if it's in the temporary internet files, but most likely yes. And you would agree that there were thousands of photos on this computer? There are almost always numerous photos to go through on a computer, yes ma'am. And uh, there were photos, uh, uh, family photos of Mr. Keatley, uh, dog photos, uh, quite a number of photos in there that that I don't recall specifically the content but certainly there were a lot of pictures now let me ask you this if I searched uh, on that laptop and I think you know what we were discussing in deposition the other day uh, I have an affinity for Great Dane so if I search for Great Dane puppies and I pull up uh, Great Dane puppies uh, on my web browser, my web browser may now save those Great Dane puppy images onto my computer, correct? Presumably any website you visit with Great Dane puppies on it would have images saved to the cache. Hopefully there are pictures of Great Dane puppies. <laughs> now when you were doing your uh, forensic investigation, uh, you were only looking for information that might be relevant to law enforcement's investigation. Is that fair? Uh, that's, it is targeted. It's specifically tried to be relevant to the investigation at hand. So, I mean, it is still just pictures and videos. And so I do provide, you know, if it's user generated pictures, sometimes those will get included, whether they're, you know, something that's like particularly of interest to the investigation or not. 
Um, it may be just this is a user generated file that was saved in the pictures folder. Um, here it is for review. Because again, I don't necessarily know, you know, what might stand out to them looking at that photo um, that might potentially be relevant that I wouldn't recognize just from, say, like the keywords that were provided. Now again, you were shown some photos today. You weren't shown all the photos that you extracted, correct? Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, those those were just a selection. Yes, ma'am. Let me show you what I previously marked as Defense Exhibit Number 35, Composite Exhibit. Now, Ms. Bell, you were uh, previously shown uh, these uh, photographs at a previous hearing in February of uh, 2020. Uh, do these photographs appear to be in the same or substantially similar condition that you previously viewed them? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move Defense Exhibit Number 35 into evidence. No objection. They'll be admitted. May I publish them to the jury? Yes, you may. And do you recall that uh, you, uh, <clears throat> one of the photographs that uh, you obtained from the user Michael Computer was uh, this photograph uh, of an arm. Again, you don't know whose arm that is, correct? Uh, well, no, but I do recall that this photo was recovered. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. And uh, let me show you the other photograph. Do you recall uh, this photograph that was recovered uh, that looks like of, of an injury to someone's uh, right hand? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, Fair to say that you are um, working for FDLE or Florida Department of Law Enforcement. You are a forensic tool uh, in a good sense, positive sense, or an assistive device for law enforcement, correct? I'd, I'd say that's a fair characterization, okay. yes. Um, I myself, Mr. Escort, Mr. Grant, any of us, we can't call you up and say, Ms. Bell, uh, we would like you to do X, Y, and Z on this laptop. Is that fair? Yes, I, I believe it's possible via a court order, but she's correct. Right. Um, you never went to the crime scene in this case, did you? No, ma'am. Now, I think you testified uh, on direct that uh, back in March of 2013, you did some keyword searches uh, that were provided to you specifically by uh, Detective Lugo. Is that correct? I think they, the keywords may have actually been provided by uh, ASA Pruner at the time, if I recall correctly. If you give me one moment, I'm going to pull that. Oh, that was a demonstrative aid. Do you have your demonstrative It's in there. There may have been additional ones provided by Detective Lugo, too. I'm not sure. But um, regardless, it would have been one of the two of them. I'm just looking for the demonstrative aid that was used. Oh, <coughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, just looking, looking at this as I. A little bit here. I, w I wanted to go over this in a little bit uh, more detail in conjunction with uh, what would be 106B <clears throat> with you. You know, so for example, you had to look up the word creeper. You, you do the search, right? Right. And uh, the computer uh, pulls out, there's a 185 possibility matches to that, correct? Well, the word itself, yes, it did appear on the hard drive 185 times. Okay. But you would agree that those 185 
uh, pulling out of those words are not what might be relevant to law enforcement, what you would pass on, correct? Agreed. All right. So what you then do is you then uh, personally do an independent investigation to get rid of all the garbage, correct? Correct. It's really just going through line by line and going, okay, this is readable. Um, this actually looks like it might somewhat make sense, et cetera. And, uh, and at that point in time, you're looking for what might be relevant. Do you correct? Yeah, it's maybe less about like, is it going to be, you know, some uh, smoking gun type thing or anything like that. It's more like, does this actually look like it's user generated? Does, is it readable? Does it seem like it's not just gobbledygook or uh, system programming or uh, part of a dictionary file maintained by a word processing app or something like that? All right, so then you condense those 92 matches after you do, excuse me, the 185 matches after you do your, your eyeball investigation you then narrow that search down. You get rid of all the garbage, correct? It, yes, it's, it's a process of just s selecting what to include in that text fragment, so that context um, around the keyword hit, and that's what gets included in the report that I provide back, that text fragments report, okay, I think. Is, the, is that the, the 106B? Yes, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to that for you. 106B, 107B. Oh, sorry. Okay. Text fragment report for Creeper. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So we have a total of, and let me look down, text, and this is a text fragment report of yours, Creeper, correct? Yes, ma'am. And when we get to it, we have a total of six on this report, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Do you recall, uh, are any of these duplicates? Do you know, or do you want me to uh, hand this to you? I don't think they should be duplicates per se, although some of the content may be similar. Um, they're not necessarily, they're unique hits. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the same text might not appear twice. I don't know if it does for this particular keyword, but it's not uncommon for that to happen. Say, um, I think I mentioned earlier that Internet Explorer, for example, has multiple files that contain almost duplicative internet history records sometimes. So sometimes you will find the same content multiple times. It's, it's a different instance of the keyword appearing, but it is the same text, the same context around it. Okay, so, but really what we're saying here is that out of the 185 that you originally had here, kind of listed as hits, really 179 of those were garbage, correct? Right. And only six, are really might be relevant, correct? That's correct. Let's go to Ocean Mist. You have 92 uh, potential hits, correct? Excuse me. I I, I, I think I, I think I remember it. Okay. Yeah. And on 107B for Ocean Mist, the text fragments, in, in fairness, looking it goes to a page two on the text fragment, there are 11. Now, do you know if any of these are duplicates? Um, again, they're like unique hits, but they may at times be the same content, just in different places. So at best, because we might have duplicates in here, at best we're talking we, out of the 92, we might have at best 11 that might be relevant, but again, we might have some duplicates. Correct. Okay. Would you mind taking a look and seeing if we have any duplicates? I can do that. May I approach you on it? Absolutely.
They all actually appear ever so. Some of them look similar, but they're not actually the same. How many look similar? Right. Maybe it's. I would say this one, this one. Three of them look pretty similar to each other, I would say. Um, two, three, and nine look pretty similar, I think. So if we, we slightly elim different, but okay, slightly different, but pretty similar. Yes, ma'am. So if we take those out of the equation, we have really nine that might be relevant. Seems fair. Okay. On regards to Bayon, Baylon, you have 11. In regards to might, uh, as far as hits, correct? 11 hits, yes, ma'am. And in regards to your tax fragment, might be relevant. You only found three that might be relevant, correct? That's correct. Let's go to Glock. Glock, you have 2,353 potential matches or here says hits. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, after weeding out all the garbage, according to your text fragment, you only have Move this up. Apologize. Five that might be relevant. Fair? Yes, there's five um, text fragments included in that report. Yes, ma'am. So that's, if I'm doing the math correctly, so I'm not an accountant, but 2,348 useless garbage hits, correct? It sounds, yes, that's how it seems. They weren't included in the report anyway. So if someone stood before this jury and said that there was 2,053 searches on that laptop for Glocks, they would have been wrong, correct? Uh, yeah, I think it's just a misphrasing. <clears throat> well, you weren't here. Were you, you've been here during the course of this whole trial? No, man. Okay. Well, not in here. I've right. been the last couple of days outside. <laughs> Fair enough. You haven't been listening to the testimony? No, man. Okay. Do you happen to have your uh, text fragment report with you? Uh, I only have it on a disk. Do you have it before you to review? The text fragments report? Yeah. Uh, it's, I only have it on my case file disk and I, I don't, we don't print all the reports. Because I'm in reviewing States Exhibit 107B, and I could be incorrect, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm looking for the text fragment report for Omar, and I don't see it in here. Can you correct me? Is it advised it's not in here? Is it possible that there were none of value for the Omar search term? Ma'am, you're here testifying, so let, let's go through that. So according to this, there are supposed to be 11,602 hits of Omar, yet 
States Exhibit 107B is supposed to be that your complete text fragment reports, correct? If, if they're not present, that just means I didn't find any text fragments okay. of value. So that would mean you found zero hits for Omar in that laptop, correct? That, yeah, that would mean that there were none of value that I looked at them and you know, Omar is one of those phrases that theoretically could kind of pop up in the middle of other words or words running on to other words, that kind of thing. Um, so it's possible that I just went through all of those, didn't find anything that looked you know, actually uh, relevant or um, you know, that didn't fall into that category of run on words or kind of like a false hit, if you will. Um, so then that wouldn't, none of them would have been included in the, in the text fragments report. So none of value is what that would work out to. So if someone stood before this jury, or someone told this jury that Omar was searched 11,602 times on that laptop computer, that person would have been wrong, correct? I think that, again, it would be a mischaracterization. It, you, I searched for it and found it that many times on the computer. It doesn't mean that the user searched that word that many times at all. Well, in fact, when you went back and did it when, in looking for law enforcement, because that was your goal, you work for law enforcement, correct? I, I work for a Department of Law Enforcement. I'm not a sworn law enforcement officer. Correct, but your, your, your goal is to looking for what might be relevant for law enforcement, right? Uh, right, it is, it is in conjunction with the criminal investigation. And you effect. found nothing, not a zero zip. I don't believe so. All right, let's go to law enforcement. According to this, there were 22 alleged hits, correct? Again, that's just 22 times that that phrase appears on that hard drive, the entire drive. <coughs> Let me show you 107B, the text fragment report. There we go. Uh, and it's a total of, let me push it up so everybody can see there's nothing underneath, three times on this text fragment report. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. So at best, that laptop, you have three might be relevant times that that search term would have been looked at on that computer. Well, again, that's just three times it appears that might be of interest. It doesn't mean necessarily that anybody searched it as a user of that computer. It just means I searched for that phrase. It appeared 22 times on the entire hard drive. Of that 22, three of them appear to have text content around it that might be uh, of interest in this investigation. What I'm going to do, Ms. Bell, is I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit, so you don't have to take my word for it, State's Exhibit 107B. The next text fragment I'm going to look for is the word uniform. May I approach you on Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Did you see the word uniform in that text fragment report? I did not. Okay. So according to the demonstrative aid, uniform was allegedly searched or found or hits 3,996 times, correct? Correct. Yet, when you weeded out all the garbage did your eyeball investigation, you found zero that might be relevant, correct? 
Correct. It did not appear to have any text fragments of value for that keyword. So if someone stood before this jury and said that there were 3,996 computer searches for the word uniform, they would have been wrong, correct? Yes, I think that, that would be a mistake. Now, you were asked to do uh, further uh, computer searches uh, for search terms, uh, I believe back in, uh, was it 2020? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, one of those search terms was Glock Conversion Kit. Uh, that sounds correct, yes. And your search found nothing? I believe that is correct. Glock modification? That also sounds correct. And you found nothing? I think so. Uh, conversion kit? I believe that was also one of them. You had one hit but nothing of value? I think that's correct. I found on no keyword hits of value on that last round of searches from 2020. Glock to rifle? No hits? That sounds correct. Roni, micro Roni, that was another one you were supposed to look up? Uh, yes, that was another one, and I searched them together. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but <laughs> anyway, no hits on that. Gun modification, no hits? I don't believe so. Glock carbine, no hits? No, I don't think so. Firearms for people with disabilities, no hits? No hits for that phrase. Limited range of motion, no hits for that phrase? Correct. Isn't it true that you were never asked to look for uh, phrases or for the names of Juan Guitron? I do not recall that ever being asked to search, no. You were never asked to search for the name Sergio Guitron? No, I don't believe so. You were never asked to use the search term magic? Magic, no, I don't think so. You were never asked to use for the search term spider? I don't believe so. You were never asked to use for the search term Jose Rodriguez? I don't think so. You were never asked to use the search terms Daniel Beltran? Daniel Beltran. I don't know. I never did a search for that either. You were never asked to use for the search term Richard Cantu? No, ma'am. You were never asked to use for the search term Gonzo? I don't recall Gonzo either. And you were never asked to do the search term Gun Gonzalo Guevara. Gonzalo Guevara. I don't recall doing that either, no. Let me uh, show you what's uh, previously been marked as defense exhibit number 33. May I approach you? Absolutely. Oh boy. I'm not going to go through every page. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, on record. <laughs> and I know you previously had viewed this. Does this appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition as you previously viewed? Yes, ma'am. And this relates to the MiFi, some, some of the excerpts for the MiFi usage. Lots of, it relates to a lot of things, yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to move into evidence of Defense Exhibit Number 33. Any objection to 33? No Defense 33 will be admitted at this time. Thank you. And uh, you would agree that Defense Exhibit Number 33 is just some excerpts from some times from approximately, you may recall, uh, November 11th through the November, I believe, early morning 25 of 2010, correct? That sounds correct, yes. Right. I think so. And I'm just going to go through 
few of these times with you. For just for example, page 4, uh, 11, 11, uh, 2010, 19, 23. You see that? Yes. Okay. And that would be. Uh, And then here, page 10 would be, go to the bottom, record 7, 1111, 11, 2010, 714, 45 seconds p.m. Let me, let me ask you something, because we, we've talked about these dates and these times, and we see something that says UTC minus 5. It's fair to say, when we're looking at these records and we see the time, the 714 and the 45 seconds p.m., that is our time here uh, here in Hillsborough County, Florida, right? Eastern Standard Time? Yes, ma'am. The UTC stands for Universal Coordinated Time, and or we also sometimes hear it called Zulu or Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and in Standard Time here in the Eastern Time Zone, we're five hours behind that, so that's why you see the UTC minus five. Okay. So anytime we're, we're seeing these time periods on these records that have been introduced by myself or the prosecutor, fair enough to say we're talking about time here in Hillsborough County, Eastern Standard Time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just flipping through, going to page 60. Same thing happened here. <coughs> Just jump to 69. So page 69. We jumped uh, 30, or actually, yeah, like 30, 40 pages, and we've only gotten three days, right? November 13. That sounds about right for All the right. event logs, yes. Claire, it seems like this Wi Fi or My Fi card, the hotspot card, is getting used a lot. Could be. Yeah. Very well could be. People like the internet. <laughs> Jumping forward, just uh, page ninety-seven. Oh, thank you. 11-22-1248, uh, record ninety-four. Again, just another example: of the MiFi card being used at that particular date, that particular time. Correct. Yes, ma'am. That's showing it connecting to the MiFi. All right. Page 93. Don't worry. This report's over 400 something pages. I'm going to get and end this pretty shortly. We'll just get to. Page 195, 1124. Uh, <coughs> so you see this on page 195, record 192, 1124, 2010 at 628 p.m. And again, that's 628 our time, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, and if I was to put forth to you that, are you? Uh, that uh, November 24, 2010, that was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Do you recall that? I if, mean, if the date of these murders was early morning hours, Thursday, November 25th, would this be the day before? Oh, yes. That makes sense. So again, just a lot of hotspot usage. 
of that um, Wi-Fi card in just a few days, correct? It appears to have been used multiple times, yes. And you're aware that people who have no Wi-Fi or spotty Wi-Fi often use those hotspot or Wi-Fi cards uh, at their home for internet connection or Wi-Fi connection, correct? Yes. Um, in fact, I believe your own sister uses a hotspot for Wi-Fi she, connection. She's actually getting internet soon, believe it or not. But uh, yes, she lives in Bronson and has had to use a, a hotspot. For but here time. we are back in 2010 in Waimama. It's not unreasonable for somebody to have a hotspot card uh, to be using that as their home internet base, is it? I don't think so. All right. Let me show you. <coughs> I apologize. If I don't put these over with the clerk, I'll, I only know what I'll do to them. my notes. Let me show you what's previously been marked as uh, State's Exhibit 105. Is this the uh, laptop and hotspot or Wi-Fi card that you've been testifying about today? It's hard for me to say for sure, but it certainly looks consistent. And the same with uh, State's Exhibit 106. Does the laptop and the hotspot card uh, that's in uh, State's Exhibit in this photograph appear to be the same laptop and hotspot card that you've been testifying to today, appear to be the same? I can't really see the hotspot, but it's, so, it's totally possible. I mean, something's clearly plugged into it. And there, the laptop looks similar. And that's exactly the point. From your view, this photograph, if that's the hotspot card, let me go back to <coughs> 105. In that photograph, 106, the hotspot card is plugged in it, into that laptop, correct? In, in the photograph 106? I can't tell for sure if the cable like runs on or if it's loose or what, but there, it does seem to be right next to it. Okay. And it's the hotspot, correct? It looks visually the same. Again, I can't tell for sure because obviously they're, uh, they have unique um, identifiers, serial numbers, that kind of thing. So I can't like definitively say, yes, it's the exact same one, but visually similar, yes. And it's in a home? Uh, it appears to be. Okay. And it's in a home and it appears to be being used in a home? It looks like so. Now, in regards to uh, the actual usage of the computer, you don't know um, who would be on that computer at any given time. You don't know if it would be Mr. Keatley. You don't know if it would be his mom. You don't know if it would be his dad, if there was multiple people living in that house, correct? That's correct. You're just testifying that some user at some point in time was on this computer, starting this computer on the Wi-Fi card, correct? Correct. Just this is what was on the computer. Let me show you what's been previously marked as Defense Exhibits 34B and 34C. <coughs> so 
34 B and 34 C. I think you previously have used uh, 34 B and 34 C. Yes, ma'am. Do 34 B and 34 C appear to be in the same or similar uh, condition or uh, presentation as you previously viewed them? Yes. At this time, I'd move them into evidence, Your Honor. Any objection? What were the numbers again? Uh, 34 B and 34 C. Uh, you know defense like 34 B and C? Any objections? No objection. no, they'll be admitted. And I know you've kind of testified uh, to this, Ms. Bell, but we really kind of didn't uh, see it um, clearly, and I wanted to kind of put it up there for the jury to see, and I don't, I don't know how to zoom in on this. So... So I believe that the you testified that the last internet search that uh, you observed was approximately where there's a human being at the computer, touching the computer, searching the computer, was 2.11 a.m.? Right, so it seems like the last user-generated internet-related uh, information saved on that computer uh, has that 2.11 a.m. timestamp. And uh, prior to that uh, time period, beginning at around 1.31 uh, a.m., and I can move this down a little bit so the jury can see it more fully. There is uh, internet activity going on from approximately 1.31 to about that 2.11 time period, correct? Correct. And uh, it appears that this person's uh, going on a dating site? Uh, correct. It looks like the Plenty of Fish website appears in multiple uh, URLs here. And that's a dating website? Yes. Uh, another one of those websites is the arms list uh, website. I think that one, uh, there was just what cookie artifact it had 2.08 or so in the morning. And uh, are you familiar with that uh, arms list is kind of like the Craigslist for firearms? I'm not familiar with it, no, but I don't <coughs> believe you. <coughs> now, um, just looking at this, you, you don't know what the, the user was doing at the time, correct, other than accessing this. You don't know if that user just got home from a party, changed, sat in their lazy boy, was getting ready for bed, and, and was go doodling around on the Internet and fell asleep, do you? No, no idea. Uh, you would have no idea if that uh, user just got home, uh, was tired, went to bed and doodled around on the internet and fell asleep, do you? I do not know. All you know is that this person got on the internet around 131 and then stopped doodling around on the internet around 211 a.m., correct? Correct. There was activity on, in an involved internet act, uh, web browser with Internet Explorer, uh, and then that's all I can say. And since you just kind of talked about that, uh, the, the cookies thing, every time I hear the cookies thing, I, I kind of laugh. I always find it funny they call it cookies, but that's just me. Let me show you publish uh, 34C. Um, when you were talking about that arms list, and I think this is what you prefer kind of seeing over here, is that 11-25-2010, at 2.08, uh, this user is using the cookies or somehow accessing cookies for uh, arms list at 208. So typically it's just the cookie get whenever the cookie is created it is just a product of visiting that website so uh, this is just the cookie itself was created at 208 so presumably that um, indicates the the actual website was visited.
Now, the photos that the state showed you in 107 G. I'm just going to give an, an example. Um, I think I have to go back. Are these the ones from the unallocated space, I believe? I believe so. Okay. Uh, do you recall that they were saved uh, on the computer on November 25th at uh, 208 or 206 in the morning? Well, if they're recovered from the unallocated space, I don't have date time info available for those. Um, they're just present on the drive. So at some point they existed on the drive as an active file. Uh, now they're just part of the un unallocated space. Do you recall ever testifying at a hearing before that these were actually saved from the, uh, were saved onto the computer at 1125 at 206? I don't know if these were, I'd have to see the actual file listing information if it was available. I just, I thought that was the one from the unallocated space. If it's from unallocated space, I can't testify date, dates and times other than what might be internally maintained in the EXIF metadata previously discussed. Um, if it's a picture file from a user directory, that's different than it will have, if it's an active file in a, in a user folder or it will have uh, dates and times associated with it. If I show you your prior testimony, would that refresh your recollection? Presumably. I'd have to, I can't just look at the picture and know the file name and all the metadata associated with it, unfortunately. give it context on the uh, page 25, 24, beginning at line 7 through page, uh, line <coughs> 18. May I approach, Your Honor? Absolutely. Okay, so if these are part of the lost files, that's a little different. Um, so lost files are files whose parent directory or parent folder that they were saved in has been deleted. And the way that the operating system works, right? The Windows keeps track of, when you save a file, it has a file, a master file table and it creates a record for that file in the master file table. Within that record, that's where it maintains all the information about that file, including the file's parent directory. If you delete that file's parent directory, that parent directory reference uh, still sits in that master file table record along with the pointers to that file's content. Uh, so it's possible to know all of the information about the file, such as where it sits on the drive, the content, um, what date and time it was created uh, or modified or last accessed, if it was maintained, but it's Vista, so it wasn't, um, and as well as the file size. The only thing that you lose when that parent directory gets deleted, if that parent directory's master file table record also gets deleted, you no longer know what that parent folder was. So it, the forensic software labels it a lost file or an orphan file. So you essentially know everything about that file except for what folder it sat in. So now knowing that these are actually orphan files or saved files. That does make a difference. Thank okay. you. Makes a big <laughs> difference, doesn't it? It does. Okay. Now, uh, knowing that 107G is orphan files, actually saved files, these were saved 
do you recall at uh, uh, on 1125 at 206 a.m.? I mean, I don't recall from looking at it. I'd have to see the file listing, but I, I'm sure you vetted that already. I'm sure you looked at it. I have, but do you recall that from your testimony? Did that refresh your recollection? I did, I did see it in there. Okay. Now, you don't know uh, who took this photograph? Oh, no, ma'am. Okay. You don't know when this photograph was taken? I do not. You don't know whose floor or carpeting this is? I do not. Uh, you don't know anything about it, do you? No, other than, I guess, that it was created around that time, 2.06 a.m. on November 25th, 2010. Not that the photograph was created, but the photograph was saved. So, yeah, created, when I say that, I mean locally on that hard drive, yes. Uh, same thing, but that was photograph number one. Thank photograph you Photograph number two. Uh, you don't know uh, when this photograph was uh, taken? No, I don't. You don't know where it was taken? I do not. You don't know who it was taken by? I do not. You don't even know whose furniture this is? I, I do not. Photograph uh, number 11. I mean, this one uh, looks like it has uh, the revolver gun and a holster. Do you see that? I do see it. Okay. Do you know whose gun <coughs> this is? I do not. Do you know uh, who took this picture? I do not. you know where it was taken? No, ma'am. When it was taken? No, ma'am. Let's go over photograph number 7. Do you know who took this photograph? I do not. When it was taken? I do not. Do you know who placed these little uh, sizing things here? I do not. Do you know if the, these photos were on arms list uh, marketplace for sale? I do not. Do you know who, where these photos were actually taken themselves? I do not. Now, I think one of the things you told us earlier about that hotspot is that it works like a cell phone, correct? Right, right. It uses the cellular network, in this case, Verizon. And when it works out like a cell phone, it, it works in the sense of that uh, if we were to, wanted to get the geographical location of where that actual hotspot was on a given date and a given time, you could actually go to that cell phone carrier and find that information out, correct? Yeah, well, they should be able to give you the what's called call detail records, and it would show like the connection activity with the various uh, towers they operate in the Verizon network, and that can be used uh, to infer some location. Did you history. ever do that? Oh, no, ma'am. Were you ever asked to do that? No, by the time I got involved in that in the case at all, it would have been long gone anyways. They, they only retain those records for you know, anywhere from like 30 to 90 days, and I didn't get involved until 2013. Were you ever provided any geographical or GPS location uh, for uh, uh, this uh, hotspot? I was not. Now, there was some discussion, oh, let me make sure I return this. There was some discussion about uh, privacy mode, and um, in case it's looked at privacy, the last two letters, instead of CY, I think it's capital I, capital E, am I correct, for computer lingo? Yes, yeah, so, well, for it's a cute Internet Explorer thing, so okay. IE, Internet Explorer. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I get it. Yes. Okay. Um, but just because somebody may have it in privacy mode doesn't mean there's anything bad going on, anything nefarious going no, on. No, I think a lot of people do that. I mean, some people 
think that putting it in privacy mode will uh, keep you from being able to be tracked um, by things like Google Ads, you know, the Google Analytics and things like that, even though it, that doesn't actually help you really with that so much. Um, but, you know, some people just always prefer to do that. Some people are just very private people, you know, especially if they're on a shared computer, which I don't know if they were or not, but the point is it's not that uncommon for people to use it, whether they're, uh, you know, up to no good or not. Well, if you're using, the, the good thing about a laptop is it can go uh, from room to room, like, like, like we saw uh, in States Exhibit 106. It can, there's a TV there, right? Yes. And it can be used while somebody's singing in the couch, correct? Screen and screen time, right. double screen time. What's there not you go. to love? And, and it could be sitting, somebody sitting in the lazy boy or another chair. As you said, screen on screen time, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. And what's good about it, so it's mobile. It could be used and somebody can go to another room. And if they want some quiet time while somebody's in there watching TV, right? Yes, that's correct. And, um, and if it's, you know, kind of like a family laptop, if somebody's on some dating websites or other websites, there's nothing wrong with putting it on privacy mode, is there? I don't have any problem with people using privacy mode for whatever they want it for. Um, did you notice that uh, on the 24th, again, the day before Thanksgiving, that there were uh, some baking sites looked at, such as Perfect Crust, Jamaican Bakery, that they, all, they too were in privacy mode? Um, I don't necessarily recall it, but I totally believe it. Did you notice that dog fashion was in privacy mode on the 24th? That's fun. I did not notice it specifically, but um, I, again, Harry I Potter it. books, nothing nefarious going on with Harry Potter books, right? Uh, I guess that depends on who you ask. You're, you're right. I, ta I take that back. I stand corrected. I stand corrected on that. All right. I don't think so. Now, uh, we talked earlier about possibly being wrong with information in this case. Do you recall that? Um, yes, I think, or at least the keyword stuff was certainly, right. I thought, mischaracterized, yes. Uh, you would agree that uh, you've been wrong with information in this case, haven't you? It's possible. Well, more than possible, isn't it true that your initial report in this case was incomplete? I mean, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how incomplete might be which initial report are we talking about the, the one March from 2013 that went all the way through February of 2020 do you recall that that report ended with the last internet search being approximately 323 something in the afternoon of February 24th 2010 um I recall using a specific <laughs> program in 2013 called Internet Evidence Finder to produce internet history reports. Um, and at the time, I provided the results that it recovered. That was done in, in 2013. Uh, subsequent to that, I did additional work in 2020 uh, with a different, newer version of that tool called Axiom and I provided all the results it recovered in that search. But I searched for the same things um, just with two different versions of the software. Well, let's go back to that for a little bit. That <coughs> initial search that you did with the initial software, blame it on, we'll blame it on the software for a moment, that uh, you only had the, you had the last internet search being on November 24th at approximately 3.26 p.m., correct? Oh, I don't, uh, no, I think that's probably not correct because I know that I had other um, reports, for example, um, that, I mean, I can't access it here. I don't have, I don't well, have you, a disk reader, but uh, I would have to pull it up. But you, it's also, a little bit different interface than the portable case thing did not exist then, um, or at least it did not exist the same way. Um, well, we know for a fact you did not have the information about uh, the 211 uh, internet usage 
in the 208 internet usage that night uh, at that time, correct? I honestly don't know. I haven't looked at that old report recently, so I'd have to like review the one from 2013 to know for sure. Do you recall being at a hearing in February of 2020, in fact, February 13, 2020, and being confronted by the, de uh, the defense attorney at that time that your report did not contain that information about the 208 and 211 internet searches? I don't recall that, but I also, you know, it's been three years, so I don't know. Well, but subsequently, after that February 2020 hearing, you were asked to go back and conduct a new search, weren't you? Well, I was asked to do several, uh, several things, one being um, the keyword searches, and I ran more internet, well, I ran the same internet history search just with the newer version of the program, and then I also added operating system artifacts. And with the newer version of the system and uh, running, what did you just say, the operating? I will say, if you looked at any of... Wait, what, what did you just say? I, I apologize. Oh, operating system artifacts. Okay, mm -hmm. so with the newer version of the system and operating artifacts, <coughs> you found in the same hard drive additional internet searches that were not contained in your initial report, correct? I'm not sure that's true, actually. I don't know that that's the case. I don't, you might be thinking of the reports Mr. White generated in 2010. No, ma'am, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about your reports. Because he's, I will tell you this, because I, I do remember this. He used a different program in 2010 uh, that did not search the volume shadow copies that we talked about earlier. So it did not report a lot of the internet history information <coughs> that was found there. Um, and I don't know that it found all of the, um, the different records that were presented in the Axiom software recovered. Um, that being said, uh, I typically testify only to the most, you know, the most recent report anyway, just because that's the newest, most up-to-date version of the software that's been used on it. Um, and that tends to have the most support. Uh, so I don't know for sure, and I couldn't verify without actually going through it. Your Honor, may we approach for a moment on this topic? A little after 3.30 or so, so if you find a good breaking point between 3.30 and 3.35, we'll, uh, we'll do that if that works, Ms. Conn. Yes, Your Honor. Now, um, Ms. Bell, when you first testified, uh, you talked to us about you get the uh, laptop and you how carefully you take to extract the hard drive and how carefully you make sure to not taint or tamper with the hard drive to get the mirror image. What, what, why do you take such precautions to make sure that you're not tainting, damaging, tampering with that, that hard drive? Why, why do you do that? 
Well, that's the original evidence, so we just want to demonstrate that, you know, take precautions to protect the integrity of that original evidence. So that's why I work with the actual hard drive as little as possible, and in fact, I actually did my initial analysis off of the image that was created by Mr. White, who uh, no longer works at FDLE, but he was the one that actually initially acquired the forensic image of the hard drive from the laptop. He verified that. Uh, and then when I went to do the work, I used his archives, made sure, again, that that hash value matched. In other words, it was the same set of data that was being examined, uh, and then proceeded with my work. So to protect the integrity of it, is it, is it your belief and your understanding that the last user uh, would have potentially have been the defendant. I mean, I have speculation. I'll caution the witness not to speculate. Answer only if you know. No, I have no idea who was using it last. Did law enforcement say to you, "Hey, we've we've touched it. We we've we've done searches." We not that I recall. No. Do but again, I didn't become involved in it until three years later, so, or two plus. Well, at the time, when you, when you are involved in investigations from the very start, is it normal practice or best practice that that computer is taken from a home in its original way that it's processed and then taken to you to forensically examine? That's the ideal scenario, I would say, yes. That's the best practice? Yes, it should. If it's, it gets a little bit nuanced because of encryption and things nowadays, if it's up and running, um, sometimes it is best to try to get the data on scene um, because if it's allowed to power off if you in an encrypted state. Um, but that was not the case at this time with this device. Um, so I would say in 2010, the best thing to do, yes, would be basically like a bag and tag. You identify it there on scene, document where it was, and collect it, package it up um, as evidence, and then submit it to the lab for analysis. So law enforcement, in, in your experience, shouldn't be tinkering and, and doing internet searches on that computer. No, I would say that is not good practice. See if I wrote it down here.
Let me show you what's been marked in uh, States Exhibit 107M. Record 44, 1129, 2010, 233 AM. That is a Yahoo search for infrared goggles, correct? Uh, it does, yes, that appears to be Yahoo search. So someone, a user, is actually typing in on the computer doing a infrared goggles search, correct? Uh, that URL reflects that, yes. All right. So let's keep track. That's one. May I ask a quick favor? Can you go all the way to the top and just see what the header for this report is? Yes. Does that help? Okay, so URLs. Okay. And then if we can go back down again. I think... Um, let me just check one thing. If may I look at my notes real fast? Of course. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right, so in record number 45, it continues on to page 22. Okay, so I'm going to try and push this up a little bit and continue on to page 22. All right, so does this appear to be a search again at 11.29, 2.33 in the morning for SIG plus mosquito on yahoo.com? Uh, the URL reflects that. I'm just um, curious about the the timestamp being associated possibly with the volume shadow copy file right there listed in the source path as the, so um, are they the same exact timestamp, 44 and 45? Uh, if we scroll back up to 44, sure. it appears to be. And are they the same exact source file? Which the with the F six seven five C five A eight. This is all gibberish to me, so yeah. I have no. I, yeah, I understand. <laughs> I have no clue. Judge, can we hand the document to the witness? Yeah. To look at yeah. It? Please. Get that out. <clears throat> and then as soon as we're done with this, we're going to take our lunch. Our lunch. Our afternoon break. <laughs> Second lunch. Yeah. Second lunch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm not. In, I'm just not entirely sure that the timestamps reflect when the surges occurred, or if they're more related to um, when the volume shadow copy was um, doing its backup work, as it were. Um, so, you know, it's. Given that they're all simultaneous, I'm not sure that that means like all of these terms were searched simultaneously at 2.33, 30 a.m. because there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, on to the next page, I guess, number of records with that timestamp. Um, I'm not sure that that's consistent with all of that being simultaneous web-based activity. Um, I'm, or if it's more related to when the file creating or file um, in which that particular URL was found um, was created or so, so that's all I'm curious in about. In order for it to even do this volume shadow backup that you're discussing, does the computer have to be on? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. It does have to be up and running. So. It has to be up and running. And it, that particular one was up in, that volume shadow copy was created 11-29-2010. Uh, Ron, if you want to take a break right here. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our afternoon break. We'll try to keep it at about 20 minutes uh, unless uh, 
You all still need a little bit more time. Please do not discuss the case about yourselves or with anyone else. Please not do any research related to the case, and uh, please do not be exposed to anything about the case outside of the courtroom. All rise for the jury. Jury has exited. Everyone may be seated. Now, normally, Miss Bell, I would say you can step down and enjoy the break. I do want you to have a break. The break's probably going to take longer than 20 minutes. The attorneys um, told me during the last approach that they um, wanted to show you something that's approximately 20 pages to refresh your recollection, and it would take too long to actually sit there and do that in front of the jury. So um, is that still correct, uh, my yes. understanding? Yes, sir. Um, Well, you can stand right next to her. Yeah, I've got, I've got copies of everything here, so I just want to know what we're referring to. Sure. Um, yeah, I've got the trial transcript. Yeah, I've got the trial transcript. Just give me a second. Actually, I don't think I've ever just asked the clip to maybe clarify it. Because it may just be a simple misstatement of the record. Yeah, I I think it's appropriate for them to do it planned, and uh, we'll come back for it. I'm sorry? I think it's, it's appropriate for her to review it, and then we'll come back for it, rather than having open court. No, no, I was going to say, we're going to go off yeah. the record, and I'm going to ask the, the state <clears throat> and the defense, talk to the witness, just like you all did before we started the cross-examination, um, to see what this particular, I don't need to know exactly what the issue is, and uh, if the issue can be resolved with some refreshing of recollection other than having the jury sit there while she reads something. So, but I also want the witness to have an opportunity to enjoy um, a little bit of break. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and be in recess and uh, you all can talk and she can ask questions or read just like you all were doing before. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Robert. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Those questions too. If you need something, you have. Yeah. Well, you may want to instead of doing it up here, you may want to step down there and do it at one of their tables. Not that I don't want you up here, but um, it's a not wanting. To
Members are ready. Are we ready, um, refreshed, and everybody's ready? Okay. Thank you, Your Honor, because we've actually worked it out where it's going to be a lot quicker. Oh. Okay. Well, I mean, it's fine. But uh, um, so, state though, I mean, I suspect it's after four o'clock now. I don't know how much uh, more time on cross, but I'm sure there's going to be some redirect. So we had already discussed we weren't going to start Lugo. So we'll uh, we'll just finish whenever this witness. Oh. All right. Let's see. Let's get let's get let's get the jury. Let's see where we're at. I mean, I told him I keep him past five, and I'm perfectly willing to do that. But I don't want to keep them past 5.30. Judge, we are running, running way behind in our trial schedule, just so you know. I know you haven't asked in a couple of days. But I know. I was planning on uh, um, asking. So probably not going to rest this week. Maybe Tuesday. Okay, maybe Tuesday. That's Approximately how long does the defense think? I know you got some experts. Judge, I, I think we're, we're probably three days conservatively. Okay. So that would get us to Friday. And we're not going to do closings and send the jury out. Um, you know, at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock on Friday. So that's going to put us into the next week. So at some point, I'm going to, let's, let's, before we hit the panic button and do anything, today's Wednesday, maybe on Friday. They're expecting to be here all next week, but we'll see where we're at on Friday, and then I'll question the jury about if we go into the next week, how many of you have conflicts that you can't change. Judge, can we, can we talk about maybe going late a couple of nights? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Or early, um, like whatever. Yep, okay. yep, yep. We can absolutely start doing that. But even, I mean, even if we go from eight thirty to five thirty, that adds an hour each day. So it does. I'm willing to do that. But I mean, unless you want to go till seven o'clock every night, which I can do. But if we bring them in at nine and we go to seven, I know. Judge. All right. I, sound, I think they're out there. We can talk about all that. Okay. Though. All right. Are you done? Yes, we are. All right. Jury in courtroom. Jury is present and seated. Everyone else may be seated at this time. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, welcome back. Was anybody exposed to anything about this case or did anybody discuss anything about this case during the break by show of hands? Let the record reflect there are no hands. Again, thank you all very much. We're going to pick up where we left off um, with the cross-examination. You may proceed. Thank you. Ms. Bell, let me show you uh, what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit 107M, page 15. Record one. I think you were previously showed this by the prosecutor, Ms. Hodges. Uh, let me see if I can pull it back a little bit. Oop, no, that's zooming in. All right. This is, says 11-29-2010, a.m. Uh, do you see that? I do. Okay. And... Uh, are we seeing activity here where an archive was, it look, appears to be, have been retrieved at that time? So this is a link file, and it does appear to show that a particular target file, that PDF document um, referenced in the second line there of the linked path, um, appears to have been uh, accessed. A link file was created for it and saved in the uh, recent directory for the uh, Michael user account on 11 29 2010 at 2 45 and 55 seconds a.m. And are you aware that uh, at that time that this laptop uh, was still at the Keatley residence but in the hands of law enforcement? Uh, prior to when I received it, I don't really know what happened to it, so no, but um, I believe you. And them uh, going on that laptop at 11.29 at 2.45 a.m. Uh, prior to it being sent to FDLE, that's not the best practice, is it? In general, we recommend as little interaction with the evidence system as possible, <clears throat> preferably none. Now, going back to a prior question um, during the break, 
you took an opportunity to review some transcripts and to review uh, uh, your old reports. And just going back to that questioning, um, you would agree now, after having an opportunity to refresh your recollection, that your initial report from 2013 through February 2020, as it came as it related to the internet history for Mr. Keatley's uh, laptop, the information and analysis that you had in your initial report was incomplete, correct? Yes, we sussed it out. So the version of Internet Evidence Finder I used in 2013 recovered the URLs but did not report the timestamps associated with them. Um, and then I didn't do anything since then before the February 2020 um, hearing. hearing. Yes. And subsequent to that, I used a newer version uh, that did report the timestamps. Okay. One more. Thank you very much for your time, Ms. Bell. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right, Ms. Bell, I'll pick up where um, defense left off. So when we're talking about that difference between the 2013 reporting and the 2020 reporting regarding the time and date stamps, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, ma'am. Was the data itself <coughs> still the same? Uh, yes, it was the, the same source data ex was examined, all of that, and nothing changed over the course of time between 2020 or 2020, or excuse me, 2013. So when we're looking at the data itself, in 2013, were the websites that were visited reported in that uh, 2013 analysis? The privacy uh, with the IE capitalized at the end, uh, URLs that Internet Evidence Finder reported just didn't have timestamps associated with them. They, it wasn't reporting them at the time. Was the 2013 report reporting the Google Analytics and the cookies? Um, I don't know that it specifically, it did not pull that out and, re and report that separately, no. So when we're looking at the 2020 analysis you did, <coughs> do you have the ability in 2020 to then look at that same data but obtain the date and timestamps for each of those internet searches? Right, the manufacturers or the vendors that produce uh, these forensic analysis tools are constantly adding support um, for all different types of information to be recovered and further improving their support for, like, say, for example, adding timestamps to a particular artifact type. So although the data is still the same data from back when the laptop was taken into custody, were you just able to obtain more information from it? Right, using an updated version of the tool. Bottom line. Significantly updated. <laughs> Bottom line, November 25th, 2010, before the hours of, before the 2.31 a.m. shutdown of that laptop is the last internet search at 2.11 a.m. Objection, Your Honor, leading. I just rephrase it, ask when the last search was. When was the last <coughs> search prior to that 2.30 a.m. shutdown on November 25th, 2010 on that laptop? I can't say for sure that it was a search. I'm just, there was that one cookie file that was dated, you know, 11-25-2010 um, at 11-25, excuse me, at 2-11 uh, a.m. And that's the last internet activity, I'll call that it. That was the last one it? that was reported. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <coughs> now let's go back to the text fragment reports. I want to follow up with you on some of that. So when we're looking at that Q search summary page, 107L, and I can pull it up if you want me to, mm -hmm. and we've got the number of searches next to each keyword search term. When that search was done, so for Glock, law enforcement, uniform, Omar, all of those search terms, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, ma'am. Were the numbers that were reported on 107L, the number of times that word shows up on the laptop? Yes, it's just the number of times that word or phrase appears on that hard drive. Can some of those words or phrases appear in the unallocated space? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> when something's in the unallocated space, do you lose potentially the context that could be around that word? You often do. So when we're losing the context that's around that word, so let's take the phrase ocean mist. 
That was one of the keyword search terms that was given to you, correct? Yes, ma'am. That showed up 92 times on the laptop? Direction leading. <coughs> Rephrase. How many times did that show up on the laptop? It's captured in that report, which okay. was L107L, I believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's back. I apologize. Thank you. Okay, 107L, our demonstrative aid. So let's talk about the term ocean mist. How many hits? did you see on that laptop for Ocean Mist? The software identified 92 hits. <clears throat> so when we're looking at that phrase, Ocean Mist, that's the word ocean and mist combined together when you're searching it? With a space in between. It's the phrase with the two words with a space in between that it's searching for. So if those two words combined were to show up in the unallocated space, are you able to obtain context supporting data around those two words it would depend on what the con like what the surrounding text was sometimes um, you might be able to tell that it's part of an HTML web page for example or something like that but it, it it all just depends on what's around it a lot of times it's just words with some other words around it it just varies so specifically talking about ocean mist and those 92 hits when you're collecting examples for the text fragment report, are you making a determination on whether you believe that there is context to support including that in your text fragment report? Yes, it's more a judgment call of just, is anybody, if you were to look at it and go, okay, well, I don't, this is just two words sitting there with nothing. You know, I may not necessarily include that unless it's part of an actual file that I can give you the file, right? Um, if it's in the unallocated space, I'm gonna wanna try to include some context, some, some text around it to hopefully um, help you visualize, you know, or um, make some uh, assessment or get you some insight into what that keyword was doing there, as it were. You know, is it part of a URL? Um, is it part of a letter? Is it part of um, a, uh, a document file name? It, so on and so on. Short of having that context around it, did you leave it out of your text fragment report? <clears throat> yes, if it's, if it's just there and I can't, like if I was to give it to you and you're just not gonna be able to make sense of it, I may not include it in the report. But does that mean that it didn't originally have context when it was in allocated space, not unallocated space? Uh, that's possible. It's entirely uh, contingent upon how it Objection, got it's there. Speculation. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll sustain a speculation and caution the, the witness not to guess or speculate. Mm -hmm. so. Let's talk specifically about the unallocated space when it comes mm -hmm. to your keyword search terms. If you have any of those that we see in 107L, any of those keywords that you searched in the unallocated space, are you going to run into circumstances where you just cannot put context to those words? It's definitely happened, yes. Okay. So when we're talking about the text fragment report and the samples that were provided, are those in fact samples and not an exhaustive list? Uh, that's correct. The samples that are provided, were they provided for every single search term that's listed on the keyword search summary? No, I didn't include, so there were some that I reviewed all the hits and none of it looked like it was relevant, um, like uniform, I think, for example, was one of them. So I didn't generate a text fragments report for that particular search term. And were some of the, we'll use uniform for an example, of those uniform keyword search hits did some, all, many, most of those come from the unallocated space? Oh, I can't say from looking at this, apologies. So when you're looking at the data from this computer, can you say, as you sit here, which came from unallocated and which would have come from allocated? Objection calls for speculation. Uh, I'll, I'll instruct the witness to answer only if you know. <laughs> if you answer that question. No, I can't say from looking at that. 
bottom line, when we're talking about unallocated space, do you have the ability to parse through that data and figure out context, date, or time? Typically, no. But again, if you can determine that it's part of a file, like a picture or something like that, that does have internal metadata or a document file, something like that, then there may be internal date and time information. But again, I'm not able to assign, you know, I'm not able to, to determine what file name that came from or what file path that was stored in when it was an active file or uh, how it got there or what dates and times were associated with it. All of that information is no longer available when it's in the unallocated space. All right, so let's talk about um, some of the, in 107, M, the larger of the reports that the state has introduced. Some of the timestamps referred to 11-29-2010. Do you know what I'm referring to? Uh, we saw some of them, I believe, earlier. Right. So when we're looking at those, I want to make sure I'm clear on what you're saying. When we're looking at those timestamps, if that, law, if that um, laptop is, let's just say, being untouched by someone, it's just sitting there, does it have the ability to be running backups, system processes, things on its own without being touched by a person? It does. Okay. When you were asked the questions on cross-examination as to whether or not this was human-derived activity or something that the laptop's doing on its own in the background, what was your answer? Uh, well, the link file that I was shown in, uh, excuse me, in cross would suggest human interaction. And then the first one that you were shown, did that suggest human interaction or was that a backup system? Um, oh, with the event, uh, excuse me, with the Dawn and Volume Shadow copy? Yes. That would be operating in the background. So even though we've got a laptop that is in law enforcement custody, if it's left on and running, does it have the ability to continue to back up and do not human-derived, but computer-derived activity. It will, but that's also part of why you caution, you know, those who are collecting the items on scene to secure that as soon as possible and, and interact with it as little as possible prior to submitting it to the lab. Does shutting the lid of a laptop shut it down? Not necessarily. It might just put it in that hibernation mode. And if it's in that hibernation mode, does it still have the ability to have system operation things running in the background? It's pretty much in stasis. It should stay like in hibernation mode until the battery dies, at which point your session, as it were, is saved in that hyberfile.sys file. So, you know, say you plug the, the laptop back in and turn it on, it'll resume uh, from that hyberfile.sys, but it shouldn't really be doing a lot while it's in that hibernation state. There shouldn't be pri background processes running. Okay, let's talk about the hotspot for a second. Um, you don't do call detail record analysis, do you? I do not. If call detail records were subpoenaed or preserved, that's not something that you're going to ever work on or take custody of. No, I think we have um, intelligence analysts that usually do that type of work. Over it's not you, though. Not me, no. All right. Um, and you made a comment on cross-examination about the immediacy of needing to obtain those records. Are you familiar with those records? Uh, yes, I mean, it comes up a lot as I a... I don't want to go into the detail of uh, your familiarity, but are you, in fact, familiar with those records? I've seen them some. I know that it's good to get them for corroborating the information that comes from the cell phone. I'm more interested in what's on the cell phone, though. That's what I focus on. So when we're talking about a hotspot and its ability to connect to cellular towers, does a hotspot have the ability <coughs> to connect to a cellular tower? That is how it communicates. And would that generate a call detail record as far as you're aware? It presumably should if it's functional and in use on that particular carrier. And do those records need to be collected almost immediately, otherwise they're lost? Uh, they do not, yeah, they do not retain them indefinitely, that's correct. All right. Your work on the hotspot is completely separate than anything that may have to do with call detail records. Correct. Defense was asking you questions about the hotspot's ability, and I'll use the photographs right here. Um, 107.5, the hotspot's ability to move from room to room in a house. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Does the hotspot have the ability to function and provide internet access to a laptop outside of a home? 
It does. Outside of an office. Yes. Outside of a building. As long as it's got power and cellular con connectivity or cell service, it should be able to do that anywhere. Can it provide internet activity <coughs> if there is cell service while you're driving in a car? That is not recommended while you are driving a car, but yes, it could do that. So, although not recommended, if a hotspot is turned on and connected to cellular activity, can it be used in a vehicle? Direction leading. Um, rephrase it. If the hotspot is working and it has cellular activity, does the hotspot provide internet access to a laptop? The location of the hotspot is almost irrelevant as long as it has cellular service and is powered on. Could a hotspot, although you're saying it's not recommended, be used in a car? Objection calls for speculation. It does appear to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caution the uh, witness not to speculate um, to the question, could something happen? Sustained. If there's cellular ability. Move to strike. Well, I don't know that she answered, but I'll tell, I'll strike any answer that she may have given to the question, could. I don't believe she gave an answer, but uh, I'll strike the question. A hotspot requires what to work? Just power and cellular service. And a hotspot has the ability to work off of cellular service where? Anywhere it can get those two things. So as long as it's charged up or plugged into a power source and it has cellular service, it should be able to function. No further questions. May this witness be released by the state or subject to recall? She's subject to recall. All right, so you can step down. You don't need to wait outside, but there's a possibility that they could call you back <coughs> to come down here later on in the trial. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I believe the state has another witness, a shorter witness that we could uh, take care of today. Yes, Judge Sergeant Jason Doyle. Sergeant Doyle. Sergeant Doyle, good afternoon and welcome. You'll come forward to be sworn wherever you're comfortable uh, in the middle there. If you'll raise your right hand, please. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm any testimony you give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? I do, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. If you'll follow the bailiff to the ramp that leads up to the witness chair, please watch your step. When you get to that chair, go ahead, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. The microphone is fully adjustable. You let me know when you're ready, and then I'll turn it over to the attorneys. All right, Ms. Johnson, you may proceed. Can you please state your first and your last name for the record? Yes, Jason Doyle. And how are you currently employed? I'm a sergeant with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office? A little over 15 years. And what, um, you said your current assignment as a sergeant. What are your duties? So I oversee the uh, aviation section, uh, the aircraft, and the personnel for that unit. And... Um, was that your position back in November of 2010? It was not. What was your position back then? In November 2010, I was a uh, patrol deputy assigned to a zone in District 4. And as a patrol deputy, what were your duties? I would answer calls for service uh, within District 4 in Hillsborough County. And where is Dic District 4 located? So the southeast area of the county. Um, what um, other areas with it? What, I guess, Cities, um, does that sure. include? Does District 4 so, include? So, uh, Ruskin, Waimama, Gibsonton, uh, Riverview. Were you working back the early morning hours of November 25th of 2010, which was Thanksgiving morning? I was. And were you uh, working in the area, your District 4 area? Yes, ma'am. Did you become assigned to a homicide investigation? I did. Yes. Was that. Um, an acute or an emergent call that you were dispatched to? It was. And um, do you recall what time that call originally came into the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office? Uh, about 2.22 in the morning. And 911 calls, um, are those placed seconds or is, is that information being relayed to HDSO within seconds of that 911 call or at the same exact time? Uh, typically it's at the same time. 
we'll receive updates as we're en route to a call. So that was at 2.22 a.m.? Yes. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. Um, where were you dispatched to at that time? I was originally dispatched to the scene. Uh, and that, what was the address of that scene? Um, it was at the 600 block. Um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Would looking at your report refresh your recollection? Yeah, it would. Do you have a copy of your report with you, or do you need me to I provide do. that to you? I've got a copy. Let me know when your recollection's been refreshed. <coughs> I'm sorry, 600 block of Ocean Mist. Um, Ocean Mist Court? Yes. Did you um, arrive at that scene? I did not make it to the scene. I made it outside the neighborhood before I was stopped. And why is that? Uh, there was already units at the scene handling the scene. I was reassigned to uh, respond to St. Joseph's Hospital to interview one of the victims of the transport to the hospital. Did you do any investigative work at all um, upon your arrival at the um, 604 Ocean Miss Court? No. So you said you were redirected to respond to St. Joseph's Hospital? That's correct. And um, did you know how many victims were there at St. Joseph's Hospital? I was told there was two victims. Do you know how the vi those victims had arrived at the hospital? Uh, via life flight. Um, and were you assigned a specific victim, um, or were you just to make contact with whoever you were able to? I was not assigned a victim. I was directed to make contact with one of them. Uh, There's two deputies that were assigned to respond to the hospital. And did do you recall approximately what time you arrived at St. Joseph's Hospital? About 3.53 in the morning. And where did you respond when you arrived there at the hospital? To the emergency area. And did you come into contact with any victim? I did. Uh, when I re initially responded to the hospital, uh, the victim was being worked on by medical staff. They advised me of the nature of his injuries. Uh, at some point between their questions, I was able to interject a, a short interview with them. And when you say interject a short interview, what is occurring um, at that time that you're conducting your interview, if anything? So the medical personnel are, are working on him actively. Uh, they're asking him questions at the same time I'm asking him questions. I'm going to interrupt my interview uh, to get the information they needed. Um, was it a situation where you were trying to get initial information to be able to relay to other law enforcement officers? It was. What were your observations of the victim at that time um, in the emergency room? So uh, the victim had multiple wounds. He had uh, two wounds to his left thigh, two wounds to his left wrist, a uh, wound below uh, his throat, and then a wound to his back. Uh, he appeared to be uh, in some sort of distress. His breathing was rapid. He was uh, wincing as, as parts of his body were moved, and the medical personnel were, uh, were working on him. Did you later ascertain the name of this victim? I did. And what, what was the name of this victim? Uh, uh, Mr. Guevara. Mr. Guevara? Yes. Was medical staff in there um, with Mr. Guevara when you were questioning him? They were. Um, were you able to conduct a detailed interview of him at this time? I was not. And why was that? Uh, he was in the process of being worked on. Uh, they were transporting him, or they wanted to transport him to multiple areas to get x-rays and, and other medical procedures done. Um, what was your goal at that point? My goal was to get uh, pertinent information, a suspect description, um, a, a very uh, brief description to pass along to units that were at the scene or in the area. Were you able to ascertain a description at that time? I was. And what was the description provided to you? He provided a description of a male that was approximately 6'1 uh, to 6'2, um, dressed in all black with uh, gold lettering across his chest with the word sheriff. Uh, described the, the white male as, as having uh, brownish orange hair, um, clear uh, prescription style glasses with chrome rims, and armed with a, uh, a pump shotgun. Was he able to um, provide you any information as to whether or not the suspect said anything? Yes, he, uh, he described the situation as, as when the subject exited the vehicle, he asked for a subject by the name of Creeper. Um, when he didn't get an indication or a response of what he wanted, he fired one round into the air, 
and asked the same question where Creeper was at. Approximately how long was your interview with him? Uh, a matter of minutes. Did you provide that information, that description, and the information you learned from Mr. Bravara to supervisors um, so that could be relayed to other law enforcement officers who were at the scene and conducting further investigation? I did. Did you remain there um, at the hospital or did you respond anywhere else? No, I remained at the hospital until I was relieved by another deputy. Were you aware whether or not um, Mr. Guevara was going to make it through through that Thanksgiving day? I was not. Um, were you relieved of your duties at St. Joseph's Hospital? I was. Did you conduct any investigation of any other victims that had um, been life flighted to St. Joseph's? I did not. Um, were you asked on a separate date to assist further with the same in homicide investigation? I was. And do you recall what date was that? Um, I was part of the search team at the time. I was um, requested to assist with a search warrant of uh, Mr. Keatley's parents' residence um, Can on you December 4th. Let me stop you for a minute. Um, <laughs> I want to go back just a little bit. Were you asked to um, or did you assist back on November 26th of 2010 um, meeting with a potential witness in the case? I, I did, yes. Um, and where is it that you needed to respond to um, to assist with this related in interview with this investigation? So on, on the 26th of uh, November, I was working off duty um, in a subdivision, South Point. Uh, when you say you were working off duty, what does that mean? Uh, the HOA uh, contracts with the sheriff's office to provide <coughs> off duty uh, deputies to patrol the area. So you are you still um, considered employed with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office? Yes. And you um, do you do the duties that you do as a patrol deputy? I do. And um, what do you do uh, at this off-duty job? Uh, we'll do anything from traffic enforcement to answer calls for service. Um, on the 26th, I was patrolling the neighborhood uh, proactively. Uh, I was stopped by um, Miss Rogan. She was on her way to the hospital. Is that Miss Stacy Rogan? It is. And um, did you initially speak with Miss Rogan? I did. Um, was she leaving her home to go to the hospital to take care of an injury that she had? She was in her vehicle on the way to the hospital. Um, did you respond to the hospital? I did. And did you notify any other supervisors, any anybody else involved with this homicide investigation to respond with you to the hospital? I did. I notified the sh uh, shift supervisor. Um, that was working that day uh, who had reached out to the homicide unit. And who did you meet with um, or who responded there who was also employed with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office to speak with Ms. Rogan? Uh, Detective Lugo met me there in, in the uh, South Bay Hospital. And did you or Detective Lugo interview Ms. Stacy Rogan there at the hospital? Detective Lugo conducted the interview at the hospital. Did you stand by? I did. Did you participate in any way in that interview? No, ma'am. <clears throat> Were you then requested on another date um, in December of 2010? I was. Do you recall what date that was? On December 4th. And what um, unit or team were you um, working with that day? Uh, I was a member of the CERT team. And what is the CERT team? It's a special incident response team. Uh, the team uh, does everything from mass search and rescues to civil unrest. Um, if there's a time when the sheriff's office needs to pull manpower, uh, the team will come together and meet the mission that it's given. How many uh, members were on the team that day? Uh, I'm not sure how many were on the team, but, but there were 16 of us that responded to assist with a search warrant. And um, you said you were assisting with a search warrant that day? That's correct. And where was the search warrant to be executed? At Mr. Keatley's uh, parents' residence. It was 4935 
uh, Bonita Drawn. Had you been there prior um, to this date to assist with any other search warrants that had been executed at that residence? I was not. And what was um, your job or your role during that day? Uh, my role was, was as a deputy searching um, the fields that surrounded the residence. Uh, were you looking for anything specific regards to this area? Uh, any type of clothing, firearms, any firearms, accessories, uh, shell casings that may have been involved. Were you responsible for the outside area or um, any of the interior areas of the home? No, everything was outside of the residence. And approximately, do you know how much um, span this property was, how large it was? About 20 acres. And is there a systematic way that the CERT team went about conducting this search over this um, property? Uh, one, one pasture at a time, uh, performing a grid search. Did you make any observations or did you alert um, any crime scene investigators to anything that you found? I did not. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. When you met with Mr. Guevara, did you have in your possession any photographs of any potential suspects? No, ma'am. Nothing further, Your Honor. Cross-examination. <coughs> Good afternoon, uh, Officer Doyle. Good afternoon. Uh, Officer, um, you were familiar uh, with the Ocean Mist community, were you not? I was. That was part of the area that you would patrol as a police officer? Yes, sir. Um, you were aware that in that particular community there's a large Hispanic population, correct? Yes, sir. And not only is there a large Hispanic population, that's an area that uh, is frequented by gangs. Yes, sir. We have. In fact, you're familiar with some of the gangs that frequent that particular area, correct? Yes, sir. Sir 13? Yes, sir. Uh, West Side? I'm um, really just familiar with the Sir 13, sir. <laughs> now, um, when you're sent out uh, to uh, interview someone that's just been shot, that's a, a pretty important task that's given to you, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, it's not the first time that you've had to do that, correct? Correct. Uh, you realize that of great importance is that you want to get a description uh, of the individual that did this, right? The, yes, the shooter. Sir. Yes, sir. And so uh, you went to the hospital that day for that purpose, correct? Yes, sir. And, uh, and Mr. Grovera uh, had suffered some injuries, serious injuries, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, but he was conscious and alert when you were questioning him. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Guevara told you in the interview that you had with him that he was seated at the front porch uh, of this home at 604 Ocean Mist Drive, correct? I don't recall him telling me he was seated, but he was on the front porch with other subjects. With about uh, uh, seven or eight people, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And he told you that he had just finished uh, two 18 uh, packs of beer. I believe the group consumed the two 18 packs. I don't believe he consumed them himself. Or did you ask him how many beers he had himself consumed? No, sir. Did you ask him whether he was under the influence of uh, cocaine during uh, this period of time there on Ocean Mist? No, sir. Did you ask him whether he had ingested any marijuana at the time that he was there on that porch? No, sir. He told you that the individual that had shot him was 6162, brownish orange hair, rosy red cheeks, with prescription glasses with chrome frames, correct? Yes, sir. He was pretty clear on that with you, were? is that correct? Yes, sir. And he said that this individual was dressed in all black, Correct? Yes, sir. With a bright gold sheriff lettering on the front of the shirt, correct? Yes, sir. And it said the word sheriff, correct? Yes, sir. He was pretty clear with you on that. He was. Mr. Guevara didn't tell you that that shirt had uh, the word police on it, correct? Correct. Because if he had told you that the shirt said police, you would have written that on your police report, 
correct? Yes, sir. So that you could give that to the detective that was assigned to this particular case, correct? Yes, sir. And Mr. Gravera didn't tell you that the shirt that the shooter was wearing said canine either, correct? Correct. Because had he told you that, you would have put that in your report so that you could then give it to then lead detective Lugo, correct? Yes, sir. He told you he was wearing this gentleman that was uh, the shooter. I mean, maybe not call him gentleman, the person that was the shooter. He was wearing all black head to toe. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that he had exited the vehicle that that shooter was in with a black pump shotgun, correct? Yes, sir. And he asked where Creeper was. Is that correct? Yes, sir. He also told you, Mr. Gravera, that the shooter had to actually rack the pump shotgun to fire it, correct? Yes, sir. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what racking a pump <coughs> shotgun consists of. Uh, sliding an action that's under the barrel. Could you show it how you would do that just uh, without the, the firearm, obviously? Sure. So holding a firearm and stand up so they can see you clearly. Holding a firearm and then sliding an action that's under the barrel, uh, down and then up. Each time you, you fire? Yes, sir. And that's what Mr. Guevara told you? Yes, sir. Mr. Guevara also told you that the shooter fired one round, right? Mm -hmm. And then he asked the question, the shooter being, asking where Creeper was, right? Yes, sir. And he was very clear when he told you that, Mr. Guevara. Yes, sir. And then, because he said the word Creeper, you wanted to know, do you know this guy, Creeper, right? Yes, sir. I mean, that uh, you wanted to give to Detective Lugo at some point in time, right? Yes, sir. And when you asked him, do you know Creeper, Mr. Guevara told you, I don't know that name or that person, correct? correct? And you wrote that in your police report so that you could give that information to then lead detective Lugo, correct? Yes, sir. And Mr. Guevara was also clear on that point, correct? Yes, sir. Did you know a guy by the name of Creeper? No, sir. Mr. Guevara then says, the shooter just started shooting then, right? Yes, sir. Now, um, my last question, I believe, is going to uh, direct you to the Keatley property. You're familiar with that area of town as well, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So, rural area of, uh, of Hillsborough County? Yes, sir. Okay. Certainly, it is not uncommon for individuals to target practice on their, on their properties in that rural area of Hillsborough County, correct? Correct. No further questions. Redirect. Sergeant, um, in cross-examination, um, defense counsel said that Mr. Guevara was clear in his description. Is that correct? Yes. And so is it fair to say that Mr. Guevara was not under the influence of any drugs or alcohol when you spoke to him? Objection, Your Honor. She's leaving. Okay, well, I'm happy to rephrase, rephrase it. Was Mr. Grobar under the influence, or did, to you, based upon your training experience, that he appeared to be under the influence of any alcohol Improper or drugs at that time? Improper predicate for that opinion testimony. Well, hold on. That's, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to require you to ask him a few more questions regarding his uh, training before he can answer that question. Yes, Your Honor. Sergeant, um, have you come into contact um, with your duties as a patrol deputy at that time? Uh, with individuals who appear to be under the influence of either drugs or alcohol. I have. And what observations did you make of those individuals? Uh, depending on, on the drug or the alcohol, it would be different uh, observations. Uh, and what are some observations that you have made of someone who's been under the influence of alcohol? So with, with a stimulant, uh, they'd be wired, uh, they'd be jittery. Um, with a depressant, they might be lethargic, uh, slurred speech, uh, very slow to respond. 
did you uh, make any observations like that of Mr. Guevara when you interviewed him um, the early morning hours of November 25th of 2010? His responses to me were very decisive. Uh, wasn't hesitation when he responded to me. Did he have any slurred speech? He did not. Did he um, appear to answer your uh, questions appropriately? He did. Um, and when you said that you had arrived to the emergency room, the, the medical personnel were actively working on Mr. Guevara when you were speaking with him? Correct. Did you make any observations about his body for of any gang tattoos or any Sir 13 tattoos? I don't recall any tattoos. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. May the sergeant be released by the state or yes, subject Your Honor. to recall? And by the defense, released or subject to recall? Subject to recall. Subject to recall. You may step down, sergeant. You don't have to wait outside. We're actually finished for the day, but there's a possibility you may receive a call over the next couple of days uh, to come back. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, while the sergeant is stepping down, I am going to let you know that uh, we are completing the proceedings for the day. It's almost 5 o'clock, a little few minutes before 5 o'clock. Same instruction to you. Please do not do any research related to the case. Please do not uh, discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. And also, please avoid all contact with any reports about the case outside of the courtroom. Um... Tomorrow we'll start at 9 because we haven't had any discussions about whether any witnesses might be available earlier. But I want to let you know now that we might start starting a little bit earlier um, just to get a little bit more time. So um, you can make those plans. I'm not going to spring that on you tonight and say we're going to start at 8.30 tomorrow. But we may start starting at 8.30. And I do want you to be prepared every night to go a little bit past 5 if necessary. But again, have a good evening. All of my prior um, requests to you regarding talking about the case during research of the case obviously will apply till we see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. All rise for the jury. is exited everyone may be seated all right i feel like i've prepped the prepped them so not tomorrow but friday if we need to start starting at 8 30 in the morning and go until six o'clock at night um i'm fine with that okay thank you judge you're welcome are we ready for i mean um tomorrow we're all set state you all right defense have anything need anything any questions I think we're good. Excellent. Well, everyone have a nice night tonight, and I'll see you in the morning.